the possible presidential candidate address a huge gender gap in the tech world. You know, and I know, there is much more work to be done. More than half of college students are women, but only a handful study technology. Ladies and gentlemen, your moderators for the day. She is a great journalist, moderator with special interest in gender equality, diversity, leadership, and digital innovation. Ulrika Fjellborg! He is an entrepreneur, innovator, well-known moderator, and don't forget, the world champion of kickboxing. Ola Alvarsson! We're asking all these companies who've been here, but also a couple of other companies, to offer internships for last year's students, uh, for girls to sort of try out these things. What an energy! Fantastic! The possible presidential here. candidate addressed a huge gender now gap I have in the some tech strange world. Strange things going on here. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Wow, hello everybody, now I can't even see you anymore. It is fantastic to be back here and just feel the energy in the room. And we have an incredible day ahead of us with brilliant speakers, thought-provoking leaders, and new knowledge. And maybe more importantly, all of you getting to meet each other. Uh, for those of you that didn't meet me last year, my name is Ola, uh, and this was sort of what I did for the first 10 years of my career. I was always afraid and I didn't have food because you have to lose weight. So I was hungry and afraid. So to try to get a good job after having been afraid and hungry for 10 years, I thought being an internet entrepreneur is kind of the same thing. You're hungry and you're afraid. So since then, um, I've started a bunch of companies. I started my 22nd company this January and some of them have failed miserably gone bankrupt, killed the dreams we were all burning for, whereas others have gone quite well. All of them, the failures and the successes, have had some things in common, and it's that is a journey that teaches you a lot, and it fills you with a lot of energy to create. So before we're kicking off, I'd just like to share some thoughts on these digital opportunities that we all have. Because we live in a magical era, an era where somebody can have an idea or a dream and actually turn them into reality in ways that people living before our time could never even dream of. Um, and it's never been more fun. Because right now, we can create things that are exponential. Before, it took 30 years to build a company, but since the technologies that we're using for many of these companies are growing exponentially, and the market that we are playing around in is growing as well exponentially. Uh, and just sort of what is exponential and what is linear? Well, if I walk 30 meters in this direction, I've gone 30 meters. If I do the same in the other direction, but exponentially, I've gone a billion meters. So when a company like Uber starts, they don't think like Taxi Stockholm or Taxi Kuri. They think something completely different. I always put a plus after their valuation because I, if I say they're worth 40 billion, somebody comes up to me afterwards and say, no, it's 80 billion now, that was last week or whatever. They, their big dream is that we're sitting 2% of our lives in traffic jams and that 15% of our cities where we should be living are filled with parked cars. That's their big dream they're pursuing. Airbnb started out with, with, with some people not keeping the, uh, affording to keep their apartment in San Francisco. So they blew up rubber mattresses and put in the living room, and now it's a $10 billion company, not many years later. So when you work with exponential technologies, if you think that um, a robot that can play Jeopardy well, very well today is smart, it's going to be twice as smart tomorrow, four times as smart the year after, and it just grows and grows and grows. And that's why I'm fascinated by these technologies. This guy is called Jack Ma, and he spoke at the SIM event 97, and he was the first Chinese entrepreneur, and it was kind of like a joke almost that a Chinese internet entrepreneur came, because he had 30,000 internet users in China. Um, 
so he came to the stage and he had a skull with him and he said, to be to be or be to see, that's the question for me. I only have 30,000 internet users. And now it's the highest valued internet company anywhere. What makes these companies different? Well, first of all, and all of these, these people that I've been speaking at events that I met or I met in other, in other contexts, they see their vision in full HD. They can zoom in and they really, really, truly believe in their dream. And I think that in Scandinavia, we have a problem because if somebody's really visionary, people say like, look at that, that's never going to happen. Or it's, it's almost like there's something bad in really believing really, really much in something. They also focus and for them, change is an opportunity. They're not afraid of change. And trying and failing is in the DNA of creating successful companies. And if you believe that trying and failing is okay, you dare try much more things. And with this view on the world, well, then every industry becomes a, a, a provocation, an invitation to change the industry and to innovate. This is, of course, a computer on wheels that can do a lot of different things. Your home of the future, what will your fridge and uh, cupboards tell you? What will the toilet tell you? I mean, we're going to have a home that is completely different just years from now, and the change is going to be exponential. Internet of the body, it's the next frontier. So it starts out with things like you put some wearables on, but very, very, very rapidly it goes from something you wear to something that you have in your body. It can build limbs, it can add functionality, you can get better memory. Uh, I tried a technology that you get more focus from that actually works. And we're just in the first baby steps because it will be twice as efficient, efficient next year and half the price and four times efficient and one fourth of the price only two years from now because it grows exponentially. This is my hand, uh, my friend who's a, a piercing artist and uh, this is in our office. You can choose whether you want to have keys or you want to have a chip. And I said when I saw it, I'm never going to get a chip. But after a while, when I'm the only idiot looking for my keys everywhere or trying to write something to my printer instead of going print, uh, I also took, took, uh, took the chance and so I have a chip. This is just the start. Google, who is here with us today, they're taking it even further. They have founded a startup to cure death, to try to find the algorithm that reverse engineers death. And the word in the corridor is that if we can only live another 40 years, these guys can probably give us another 40. And that, of course, these technologies are going to impact every industry. And if you look at the people in the audience, they, you come from every different industry, from students to business leaders of the largest companies and industries. Just take a couple of them. Let's say you were heading a logistics company and you had lots of people driving cars, sitting in queues and delivering mails and boxes to people. And then you see this for the first time. It costs eight cents to deliver a package, environmental friendly. And what would you do? Would you sell all your cars or what would you do? Probably panic. Also, if you had a prison somewhere and you see 300 of these coming every night, which is happening and delivering drugs, what would you do? So these technologies are creating problems and solving problems at a speed we've never seen before. Venture capital, they used to be like record company bosses. It was very difficult to get a hold of them. Now I can put any dream or idea on Kickstarter, and if people believe in that dream, they can fund my idea through crowdfunding. Retail, this is Netapotea from their store in London. One of the best streets in London. The store is about four centimeters big, and you can shop as much as you like. So retail is just completely being rewritten as well. And these disruptions, these changes of industries, they happen in ways we can't understand. So I've been doing this for 20 years. I'm not smarter now than 20 years ago, probably dumber. I don't know if somebody's, something's going to work or not. But uh, for instance, if you're a taxi driver and you see that the iPhone comes up, it's very difficult to think, oh, I'll probably be out of business eight years from now because somebody invents Uber. But when these technologies connect in a new way, the arena be becomes rewritten. So how do you get it right? Well, I don't really know, but I think that it's about, about mindset and leadership. I think it's about having brave leaders that dare to try and that are not afraid of change makers internally. It's about finding people with fire in the belly and empower them, even if they're young, even if they don't have the job title, but if they have the willingness uh, and passion to change. 
I also think it's very important to be part of innovative conversations. I sometimes ask an audience, where are you most creative? And you hear the strangest things where people are creative, but none has ever said, uh, I'm creative in the office. And that's where we put people to create things, which I think is kind of funny. So I think that instead, if you're in places like this, if you cross-pollinate, if you're open, and in the spirit of women in tech, uh, you can just grab anybody, talk about anything, and connect during these days and after. And I also think that embracing startup mentality, you don't have to be a startup and be in a basement eating noodles, but you can have startup mentality, which is curious, trying things, and also failing sometimes with a smile. And drive not with systems and processes and a lot of boring things, but with vision and passion. Because that's something that startups can teach us a lot about, and you'll see that throughout the day. How many people play bandy here? Raise a hand, please. We have one bandy player. You're the first bandy player I've ever met in my life, real life. But it's on television all the time. Why is bandy on television all the time? Whereas you have lots of undercurrents that are never there. This is from Dream Hackix, for example. But there are a lot of these other undercurrents that are ignored by traditional company. I see that as a huge opportunity if you understand these things faster and earlier. And the ones of you that recruit, Recruit change makers. Change makers that doesn't look and sound or talk like the ones you have already in your company. That's why they make change. And I think it's very, very difficult to change if you keep the same people and if you recruit the same people, which is why diversity is extremely important. Massive transformative purpose, MTP, the new trend word in Silicon Valley. Do you have something that you really, really care deeply about doing? And we're going to hear some massive transformative purpose. Maybe the most interesting and, and thought-provoking and important thing we'll hear today is from Yeonmi Park, who decided to take on the Korean dictatorship herself and is on a good way, uh, and we'll hear her story. Finishing off with some strange observations. How strange can the, 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 the society we live in be in 20 years if we keep on inventing things and trying things? Well, first of all, we're going to have 500 billion connected devices. I don't know how much that is, but it sounds like a lot of connected devices. Everything will be connected. We might have an age of abundance that all the problems we have right now, electricity or food and things like that, we've solved that in 20 years because it's, the solutions are growing exponentially. But we'll have completely different problems. We'll have one billion new robots, and in Japan, a hotel completely managed by robot opened a couple of weeks ago. There is a kindergarten where 60% of the teachers or caregivers are robots. And two interesting data points. One, they are more popular among the kids, and two, they teach the kids more things because they speak all languages and, they, and so forth. <laughs> Scary. <laughs> Lifespan over 100 years. There's a plus after there as of before that. It could be 150. And this blew my mind completely. We are going to have perfect lie detectors. Can you imagine? You go to law school five years, you work your way into to the court system, and it's like, no, we have lie detectors now, you're not needed. Did you do it? Yes, four years. <laughs> or, honey, we've been married for some years now, I'd like you to put on your lie detector. Or, um, do you think I'm going, doing a good job? What would it be in a completely honest society? And these things will change, and they will keep on changing, so change will be a constant. But there are certain things that will never change, and I'm very happy for that, because uh, the curious wins, and that's what we're going to be here together. So we're going to be very curious, and I'd like to see my dear partner in crime, Ulrika, enter the stage. Give it up for Ulrika Fjellborg. Thank you, thank you, Ola. Thank you, audience for coming here and uh, visiting us and listening to all the fabulous stories we're going to tell you tonight. I really like your, your thing here about curiosity because that's actually what's always driven me in my profession as a journalist and uh, that's a good source to, to dig in. Just imagine you're able to call up anyone at any time and ask them anything. That's fabulous about this profession. Besides the really good opportunity to tell stories. And that is what we're going to do here tonight, tell stories. Thanks to the organizers, MTGX, Google, Spotify, Tele2, Bonnier, Telia Sonera and Shipstead, who invited us all to, to tell and to listen to 
fabulous stories. In I think this that merits story. a warm round of applause for our dear exactly. partners. Exactly, applause. So, we actually put together a program here for you tonight, and we're going to listen to really enthusiastic entrepreneurs, passionate entrepreneurs, devoted change makers in the business and in their own companies. We're going to show the importance of how important it is to start early with Isabella Södergren from Kids Hack Day. Mm -hmm. And we, we want you to learn what you need to learn through the way in your profession with Pauline Nemotliba Söderlund. And we will also hear Sofia Jakobsson at Chalmers Innovation talk about how to get women to start startups. We have another speaker. We have Anna Litagen, Talent Tribe, who's going to tell us about how Hillary Clinton's golden rules of leadership gone into a global movement. Investor manager Marta Sjögren at North Zone, she's going to tell us how we get the investors to open up the wallet. Please, let us start our companies. And you will get some brilliant leadership lessons from really top, top executives. Ingrid Bonde at Vattenfall, Helene Barnikov at Telia Sonera, and Anne Vigelius, TV entrepreneur and senior advisor. Isn't that brilliant, one? And not enough. We will also get a tete a tete with Mia Brunel, mm -hmm. Shinevig's former CEO and today a board professional. And the fabulous story that you told us of, mm. Ola, the North Korean freedom activist, Yeonmi Park. At the end of the day, we will honor the very first winners in Women in Tech Award. So, lots of interesting stories mm -hmm. that you will love to tell anyone else after you've been here tonight. But now you are going to invite our first international guest. Tonight. I will, mm -hmm. I will. And, and if you look at cities in technology, uh, there's very few cities that have created international success. You think that it can happen anywhere, and maybe it can, but there's only 16 cities where international tech companies have been globally successful. Mm -hmm. And Stockholm is certainly one of them. And it's the second most successful city. There's only one which is success more successful, and that's, of course, Silicon Valley. So we wanted to start with some wisdom from the valley. And I'm yes. going to invite somebody who's been a management consultant, an academic, PhD student, and she's gone over to the valley. And not only is she running a company very successfully, she is also the founder of Women in Wireless, an organization with 10,000 women organized all over the US. So with that, I'd like to give the stage to Charlotte Fosch. Yes. Very welcome. Please, welcome. Welcome to Stockholm, Sweden. Have a seat. Thank you. I've Thank always you. wanted to have my own TV show, and then I would sit like this, and I would definitely invite you as my guest. I'll remove this. So, <laughs> Silicon Valley, you're, you're, uh, you're global head of sales of, of M Blocks. I'd like to start that. What is M Blocks doing? So, M Blocks is the largest global messaging provider. We do SMS, um, MMS push. We provide that service to all the large online companies like Yahoo, Facebook, we work with Google, we work with a lot of large banks, um, many brands that want to do mobile marketing. So all of these guys are using your services without even knowing it? Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, uh, so that's Mblox, but I want to start with, with uh, Women in Wireless. Yes. What is that and, and, and why did you create that? So I came over to the US back in 2004 and to join the mobile industry. And initially I didn't really think about that there were no women, but fairly soon I figured out that everyone knew my name. So I could walk down into a big conference hall and everyone would say, hey Charlotte, hey Charlotte, hey Charlotte. And I didn't know who they were. So I started thinking about where are all the women? And I wanted to be a part of making a change in my industry, and I started an organization together with another woman called Women in Wireless. Mm -hmm. And our mission was really to connect, promote, and develop women. And what was the response? Y amazing. Initially, so back six years ago, we were 30, 40 women. They all formed uh, the leadership team together with us. But we grow really fast. Um, we started organizing a lot of networking events. 
Uh, we had leadership seminars. Uh, we started building up a database with female speakers because that was another thing that I would see. I would go to those conferences and there were panels, speakers, and they were all men. So why is that? Mm. And after talking to the amazing women I knew in the industry, I knew that there a lot of women would like to, s to speak, but they're not going to raise their hand and say, yes, I want to be on a panel. So we built up a database and started promoting our database or speakers to the large mobile events in, in the Valley and in the rest of the US. And how is it to work in the Valley? So th is there anything we could learn from there? Um, that you think, I mean, you know the Swedish market and you know Silicon Valley. What could we learn? I think the Silicon Valley is just an amazing place. You have people from all over the world coming together um, with a lot of talents wanting to be a part of the valley and what's going on. So it's very, you were talking about diversification. I mean, that's huge. So I think not just working with the same type of people that you are yourself, but working with different type of people, mm. men, women, people from other world. I think that's something we can learn. And I think that will help us accelerate instead of just being on that um, train doing the same thing. It's a little bit harder, but it's more interesting. And what can tech leaders do to, 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 to lure more leaders from other sectors? Because I think that from a competitive perspective, if I look at, upon Stockholm, we need to get a lot of female leaders from other industries to come to tech and media and so forth. Not media so much as technology, but definitely in tech. What can, what can leaders do? I think, I mean, being a part of this event, being a sponsor is huge. That is really showing the women that are working for your organization that we are an organization that takes this serious. I, I think that's, that's one thing. Um, and then finding that there are a lot of women. You just have to work a little bit harder sometimes to find them. Because I, see, I think, if, you know, looking at Silicon Valley is still very male-oriented. Mm. And looking at the venture cap industry is very male-oriented. And it's so simple to look at one of those young guys, um, entrepreneurs, and say, wow, that was me 10 years ago. Mm, I'm going mm, to invest mm, in mm, his mm. company. But I just read the other day that um, some of the executives from Twitter... Angels. Angels. Yeah. I love that. Um, Angel is uh, it's some of the, 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 the most successful business leaders in Silicon Valley. The women leaders have gone together and created Angels, which is an investment group with only women. Uh, they invest in men's companies as well, they or do. anybody's company, but it's, it's, you have to be a, a successful woman to invest in yeah. it. Yeah, and I think that's needed, but I, I do... I do think that we're seeing a change and things like mm. that is really helping. Mm. And l things like this. Tell us about your career. So you management consulting and then uh, PhD student and all of a sudden the Valley. What, what sort of what were the transitional points in your, your career? I think I, um, you know, I went to university and, and felt like I was not done. I needed to do more. So I joined um, a it was called the PhD school program at uh, Linköping uh, University. And there was one from every uh, faculty. So we were 10 students every year. So we were working together on different projects. And that was just an amazing time. So I did my license eight thesis and I said, I can't sit in my room reading books anymore. So I started working for Connecta mm -hmm. and worked on, on their strategy team for a bit. And then I felt like I, I need to get out even more than being a strategy consultant producing slides. Um, so after a few years, I met um, one of the guys that is actually here today, the CTO of Spotify, and he was at the time working for Mblocks. And just joining that young, they were all younger than I am, um, entrepreneurs, uh, startup guys that wanted to create this largest global messaging provider in the world and be a part of their mission, their ride, um, ha having the opportunity to transfer. I was asked to trans transfer to the US when we had just bought a company there. And, and just doing that was mm. just amazing. What fuels your own passion? So today, so after starting Women in Wireless and um, handing over the leadership to the next women to drive the organization, uh, we, we we formed a board and that has led to new boards position. And that's 
one of the things that I'm really passionate about, about being, um, being a part of company sports, being able to help, sharing my network in Silicon Valley. Uh, I think that's one of the things that is really driving me, as well as making a change in this world for women. I have a daughter myself, and I want, when she's only eight today, but when she's a grown up, I want her to get the same type of opportunities that any person would have. If you wake up Monday morning extremely surprised because you're the president of the United States. Oh, I love that. Uh, the first female president. And <laughs> the, the first thing you need to deal with was how do I create more entrepreneurship and how do I create a much better gender balance in, uh, in technology? So this is going to be a um, bit of a culture difference here because the US is different. And I was telling uh, Oscar this when we had breakfast this morning that there are few things in the US that makes it really hard for women. And one of the things is childcare. It's very expensive. So a lot of my friends here in Sweden, they have two, two three children. Um, and if you have to pay $1,000 per child, that mm -hmm. is really preventing mm -hmm. women in their earlier careers to uh, continue to work. Mm -hmm. And um, taxes, not having uh, paternity leave is another thing that is um, push, you know, a force pushing back women to be out there. A lot of, I know a lot of really brilliant women in the Valley that are stay-at-home mom and they want to get out, but their situation doesn't, it doesn't really work. So that would one thing, I would definitely change some of the regulations and laws and tax systems in the US. And then I would find a, a, a couple of organizations that I would help sponsor. So women in tech and the same thing as women in wireless, we all rely on sponsors. Mm -hmm. We don't have employees. We are working night times, weekends mm -hmm. to drive our mission. And as an organization like that, be able to get some funding. I think that's another thing that I would like to, to do. And then in, in terms of entrepreneurships, um, I think, get there early with the kids. In my daughter's school, they have um, science fairs. I love that. And every child wants to be in the science fair. So two weeks ago when we had our science fairs, you can barely place your project because every school, every, every kid in the whole school has done the projects. And I think starting really early is, is important. And making sure that uh, the kids understand how important this is. We're going to have a, a deeper look at that with Kids Hack later on. But uh, moving from kids to, to museums, you're starting a museum as well. Uh, it's not me, but I'm on the um, advisory founding board of a mm. new wireless museum in San Francisco. It's the first wireless museum apparently in the world. Uh, that's not part of a technical museum. And um, what we are working is, uh, what, what it's going to be is, you can go there and learn about the, the history of wireless, but you can also, if you're a teacher, bring your class and they can be there and explore. We're going to have summer programs, um, come and build your own app. So I think I'm, we'll have to sign up my daughter the, <laughs> the first time. And uh, I think that's another way how we can, can help bring technology out uh, to, to the kids. So if you would give advice to somebody who wants to build and change, that is 20 and that is 30. So what would you give the 20 year old uh, just out of school? Um, the, one, uh, the one that is 20, I would um, talk to them about mentors. I'm a big believer in mentor, mentors. I think uh, find a woman or a man, come to me, I have a good network, <laughs> I can help you. <laughs> Uh, but I think that's, that's it, to have someone that you can hold, in, um, hold hands with and, and feel like you're... Because being an entrepreneur and wanting to do things, you're going to be really lonely from time to time. And having people to talk to, so mentor, and then building your network. I think building your network is, is really important because and, and they're going to help you. And if you're 30? Let's go. <laughs> do it. <laughs> Last question. What's most exciting right now? Uh, most exciting, I, I think, I, I love the mobile space, but I think some of the, the trends that you were talking about today, we're going to get more and more connected um, in your car, in your home, everywhere, which also opens up for, for companies to 
promote the products in a different way because they will know more about you and you will know more about them. So. Thank you very much for sharing and you'll thank be staying you. here and I think that you'll have a lot of incoming calls for mentorship. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So entrepreneurship, in my view, it's the willingness and uh, curiosity to try. And I don't like the picture of an entrepreneur sitting in a basement somewhere, trying uh, eating noodles and only doing technology. Anybody who's creative and wants to do something in my world is an entrepreneur. So for me, some of the coolest entrepreneurs are the new uh, blog and video superstars. And when, when getting to know this, this uh, coming speaker, I just watched a couple of clips and then I was like stuck for 48 hours just looking at cool stuff. So it's a treat to deliver you Clara Henry. Welcome. <laughs> My, it is on. Thank you, Ola. Um, hello, everybody. Hope you're having a nice time. Uh, my name is Clara Henry. I am 20 years old, and I am. Uh, well, uh, my manager says that I need to brag more because I don't like it, but he says that it's good for me. So I'll just start off with saying that I am the most subscribed to woman in the Nordic countries on YouTube, thank you, which is pretty cool. I love YouTube and I do video blogs. I talk about my life, um, like uh, stuff that just pops up in my head. I have done like, I think 120 videos in total. 10 of them is about menstruation and honestly, and I talk about feminism, and I also talk about like why Justin Bieber is a fan of One Direction, and like what kind of New Year's resolutions that you won't be able to keep, and so on. And I think it is fantastic that this engages so many people, and especially young people. Um, I have, uh, I think, like 310,000 subscribers. I get between one and a half to two million views each month. And uh, yeah, that's what I do. And I can make a living out of it. <laughs> Yay, like, I'm like the ideal 90s kid. <laughs> I love the internet. Uh, yeah, I think that's me. Perfect, have Yay. a seat. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Another round of applause. <laughs> The next guest has a completely different profile, showing that creativity and curiosity comes in many forms. She's a hardcore inventor. She's invented High Nation, which is a solar-powered lamp, and she's also created a very interesting technology hub. Linda, welcome up on stage. Hi. Thank you, Ola. I'm so impressed with you, Clara. Thank you. Uh, I'm a bit older than you are, and I've never seen you, but that's amazing. You just brag on, <laughs> brag on, I love it. Uh, I'm Linda. Uh, I founded a company called High Nation about seven years ago, and I made this, and that means I made this. I can actually, um, I decided to make a rough product for people who lack access to power. Uh, how many of you guys have a phone here? <laughs> Quite a few. Uh, how many will be out of power by the end of this afternoon? <laughs> <laughs> Say no more. And uh, actually, I was first focused on working with the outdoor market in, in Europe. Lots of money, uh, lots of devices that you want to charge when you're up on the mountain in peace. You better update Facebook anyway, just in case, and you want to track your steps on GPS and so on. After some time, I uh, started hearing about Africa. And once you start getting your mind into Africa, you can't go back. I mean, it's amazing what's happening down there. Uh, the guys have, I, if I would have an, an African crowd in front of me, at least as many hands would be raised when I asked how many has got a phone. Uh, every 
grown-up people or person that I meet in Africa has got a phone, or two, or three. It's crazy. Uh, the issue is that you normally don't have any power. Uh, I worked a lot with the Maasai's in northern Tanzania, and they have to walk for um, half a day, at least. 26 kilometers uh, with the Maasai tribe I work with to get power. And then you don't spend too much time wasting energy on your phone. Cost them between five and ten kroners to charge your phone, uh, which is a lot of money. So what we decided to do is to promote this product. It's a solar product, so you actually put this in the sun, and they've got plenty of sun. So that's another problem. Put it in the sun, uh, you charge it, and out of that you get the power, uh, you get light for up to 20 hours, or you can actually charge your phone on it. It's got a regular USB. Uh, and that's what we do. And once I got started traveling to Africa, it's, like I said, it's an amazing experience. Uh, I started out with the mindset of making money and saving the world. And to be honest with you guys, I haven't made a lot of money, uh, but I've started saving the world, and actually something I would top over making money by now is making experience because I've seen so many things, uh, traveled to so many strange places. Um, when I was in traveling in India last time, I was in the, um, up in Ranchi in um, Rajasthan, uh, no, in, in um, Jharkhand, one of the northeastern states. And uh, we were traveling, we were driving with a car for an hour out in the countryside. Once the road stopped, we had to walk for one and a half hour. And, uh, well, everything was fine. It was amazing how I mean, the treatment we get and how positive people are. Uh, then we got back to Delhi to talk to the Indian government about it. And they said, no, no, you can't go to, to Jharkhand. We said, well, we just did. No, no, you can't. You will be kidnapped by the Naxalite gorilla. <laughs> I said, no, but we were not. We were, um, we're here. So um, you get a lot of new experiences. So um, tough gets cool experience. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Some time ago, I, I went and visited Soup46 and sort of check out what all, all the cool companies there are doing. And I felt completely in love with one company uh, and was super impressed by the entrepreneur. And she is doing something extremely cool. And I'm not even going to try to tell it because you do it much better. Rosie, welcome. The stage is yours. <laughs> My name is Rosie Linder. I'm a founder of Peppy Pals. Uh, we create emotional intelligence games for children from age two to six and their parents, simply because we want to create a world with higher emotional intelligence and more empathy. Speaking about empathy, uh, this is a simple way for me to show <laughs> the difference between having empathy and lacking empathy. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, but I believe that we need more Gandhis and less Hitlers into this world. <laughs> <laughs> bullying and cyberbullying are huge problems and they're growing worldwide. And just in Sweden, 50 children suicide because of bullying. The good news is that research shows that you can actually practice on empathy and you have to practice on emotional intelligence throughout your lifetime. So that's why we gamify emotional intelligence. So the dog, you see the ripples show the finger touch of the kid or the player and the dog is frightened. And you can feel it and you can see it in the eyes. So what we are doing here is to help the dog to take a deep breath I need to take a deep breath too. <laughs> and after that, uh, the dog is relaxed enough to take, enjoy the ride. That wasn't that scary. So in the next stage of the same scenario, you have the owl on the top of the slide, frightened as well. So what you don't, we don't need some kind of friend who push down the owl, but what we are going to teach the owl is to also take a deep breath, and when we do it together, 
please join them. Take a deep breath. <laughs> and after that, they actually can proceed the ride and enjoy it together. <laughs> So you may think this is a very simple scenario, but actually it handles three very important life skills, and that is stress management, overcoming fear, and collaboration. Uh, we have uh, two games on the market, and Pepe Paz was born global, so that's why it's available worldwide in all platforms, and today we are actually number one and in App Store, uh, both category kids, so thank you. <laughs> and we have also released three books as study material through uh, the publisher Nature and Culture. Some bragging here, we have had a huge interest from media. Pepe Paz was reviewed in uh, Gumaron Svarie twice and with very high ratings. Uh, we are proud winner of the prestigious Reach for Change, and uh, we have some cool collaboration with Amazon and Microsoft also. And uh, I want to end this presentation with uh, a picture of my brilliant team, and there are also co-founders, uh, all of them into uh, Pepe Pal, so that makes them very dedicated. Thank you. Bravo, have a seat. What a fantastic panel. Uh, I would like to start with finding out what fuels your passion. Clara? I'm going to start off with moving yeah, this moving plant because the, I have it in we, my we, face. Yeah, we have a, <laughs> a vegetable problem here. I had it there over, <laughs> over there as well. Um, I think there are a lot of things fueling my creativity. Um, I think I am a creative person, mm -hmm. so I when I uh, like think, what am I going to vlog about next time? I can like overhear someone on the bus speaking about something, and I'm like, that's very funny for me only because I like see a vlog in my head before it's done. So I hear stuff and I see stuff and I take them and I like do it in my head and then I put it down on paper. It feels supernatural when you watch you. It doesn't look like you're following a script, do you? I do, mm -hmm. uh, every time. And that's, uh, that means a lot to me to hear <laughs> that it sounds like I'm not. Um, but also I get a lot of feedback from my fans and my followers. And when they s write stuff to me, uh, can you talk about this or do this or test this? Uh, then if I find it interesting or fun, then I will do that. So I get a lot of feedback from my fans. I, I have one Mexican fan in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> I was, yeah, there she is. Great. Ah, I was so Suecia. proud. <laughs> So, what, what fuels your, your uh, passion to create? Uh, well, I was actually, my, my biggest fear was to uh, get old and uh, never dare. I had, a, I had a career as a management consultant before, and I could see the whole career going, I mean, super straight, like a highway. And I was, I was actually kind of triggered by my fear of not trying. We've only got one life, or as far as we know. And uh, I want to make the most of it and try the most. And I guess that's uh, fueling my creativity. Like you said, sitting on the bus, I got to go to different places and meet different people and uh, like put myself in different situations because it kind of kicks my brain one way or another. And that makes me see on, see, especially the issues. I mean, like an entrepreneur, you will run into issues all the time. Mm -hmm. And you just got to put on that, like, it hat and, and find new ideas and sometimes you get it in the most unexpected places so uh, just going to work every day nine to five that would kill my creativity completely mm -hmm. gotta try new things Rosie I see myself as a social entrepreneur I know that it doesn't sound so cool but mm -hmm. I think you can actually combine the social things issues with um, the commercial so I try to do that, and the best thing I know is when parents send me emails telling me that they have, you know, used my tools, and the kids have started to express lots of emotions. So that's the best thing for me. Gives I think I think it's not uh, not at all uncool to be a social <laughs> entrepreneur. I think that all entrepreneurs needs to be social in the future because yeah. I think that people, if you're not doing it for the right reason, people won't care after a while. Yeah, um, I'm happy to hear it. And and. Um, so, so uh, another question. You're, you're starting a tech, a tech hub of sorts. Could you, could you tell me about that? 
Yeah, that's, uh, that's actually my next project, which is really amazing. I'm so happy to tell you guys about it. But don't tell any media, because it's kind of stay below the radar. And um, I'm managing uh, from like October, November, somewhere, that's uh, on KPH. Does this work? We got some problems here, something. Mm -hmm. Warm round of applause for Sand as well, who's producing events. <laughs> All right, yes, I'm back. <laughs> so uh, I'm actually managing a house at KTH, uh, 2,000 square meters, where we're uh, allowing space for hardware startups, which is just so cool. I mean, you mentioned 50 billion connected devices, right? Assume that we'll be 10 billion people in a while. That's 50 pieces of head across the globe. <laughs> And uh, we want to help creating uh, the new Swedish success stories in that sense. So if you guys have got any hardware startups, hit me because we want to fill the house with the most amazing ones. And of course, in the back of my head, I want to fill it with the most amazing women tech startups, of course. So, um, but just how, how important is the environment? I mean, you sit in Soup 46. Yes. Uh, I, my latest startup was. 8,000 square meters, epicenter for entrepreneurs, Splay is sitting there among others. So, so w w sort of how important is that and, and for, for you as, as entrepreneurs? What, what networks around you made you successful? Well, I'm so dependent on of myself all the time. I, whatever I do, I'm on my own. And I have people that I work with, but I'm always like, I am Clara Henry and that is who I am and that is what I do. Is that, is, that, so, is that lonely or is that no. a freedom? No, I think it's nice. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Um, but that means also that I have to work on my own and I work from home a lot of, a lot mm. of the time. And uh, since I am on my own, I live quite s small. <laughs> and that kind of um, strangles my creativity in a lot of times, I think. So, my, uh, what I prefer is just to change my environment all the time, like to vary myself, like I go to a cafe or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think that's what I find important to do. Rosie? I actually love Sub46 because the fact that um, you can act, meet lots of investors also in the mm. same place. And not, even, not only asking for money, but ask also for their feedback. And you can, you know, just... Uh, do your coffee peach very informally. So I, I love the fact that it's, um, you know, they have gathered entrepreneurs and investors in the same place. So it's brilliant. What, what would your advice? So, yeah, yeah when, when we had a meeting with some of the companies moving into us last week, what people also uh, was pushing on why they moved in with us was building the network with the other brains. Mm -hmm. So the investors yeah. and so on and, and yes. industry partners but also, if you put a lot of brains working with the same, same mindset, same energy, mm -hmm. same vibe, yes. you, you feed so much of each other. And I think and that's what you're saying, the same mindset is very important. Yeah. The same thing, then it becomes same, same. So I think different things, but same mindset is very important. Yes. Um, if you would give advice to the will-be entrepreneurs, the people out here that are gonna create amazing companies, they might not know it yet, but they will. What would the advice be? Or it doesn't have to be a company. It could be a fantastic media career or whatever. I have a good one. Uh, I'm not a tech woman. And I mean, when I started to, with Peppy Pals, I didn't know anything about gaming. But sometimes I think that was my advantage because I was naive enough to think that everything is possible and how hard can it be? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that actually sometimes is positive. Um, if you are outside the box in order to be able to think outside the box. So that's it. I think I agree. Like you have to um, see the possibilities instead of yeah. the opposites. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I never saw myself as an entrepreneur. I just started doing YouTube videos and then it turned out into like, I had to start a company so I could send invoices to people. And then I took it from there. So I think just do what you want to do, like yeah. YOLO. Applause <laughs> 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 are nice. I would like to add, build your team, mm. uh, because uh, unless you are like you, Clara, <laughs> 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 who doesn't need anyone else. In my world, when I had to build the, the highlights, 
I needed someone who could do, I mean, uh, electronic design, physical design, could, I mean, everything. Talk to these strange markets I'd never dared to go to before. Uh, and dare to talk about your idea, because, like, just today, when you go out for a coffee afterwards, talk to at least five people mm -hmm. and tell them what you want to do, because the likelihood of finding someone who's like, that's a great idea, I would like to join, how can I help? is a lot bigger if you tell people what you want to do. Uh, sometimes entrepreneurs come to me and say, you know what, I've got the most brilliant idea in the world. Okay, I say, well, tell me, what is it? No, it's too secret. <laughs> okay, but then I don't know who to connect you with. But, I mean, I can't give you my five cents of, of experience because you're too secretive about it. Talk about what you want to do and just keep that little grain of secret stuff <laughs> and, and talk about the rest. Thank you very much for coming here sharing and you're going to be here and I think that you'll, you'll have a lot of interesting conversations in the break later on. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. How many of you have seen uh, Clara on YouTube? Raise a hand. The others of you, you're in for a treat. Wow. What a what start. A, yeah. <laughs> It's incredible, so much passion in building three companies. Lovely, I think. It's, it's really good to hear that you can, out of your, you know, your thoughts, your hobbies, what you like to do in your private life, just build a company. Fascinating, don't you think? And I also like that Rosie says that not knowing was her secret weapon, and I think that's, that's true for a lot of entrepreneurial companies. Mm, but you've done it many times. <laughs> Yeah, d d d with, with varying degrees of success, but, but it's also it's the first step, you know, just start doing it would be my advice. Pursue it, talk to people as you said as well. Mm. Uh, I thought, when, when people say entrepreneur, what do you think of them? I, I, I used to think that there was uh, a guy that knew how to program sitting in a basement with ugly clothes and eating noodles. But you used to think that. I used to think that. Mm. But, but then, then you became one. Yes, and, and I can happened? program, and I'm pretty well dressed. So, yeah, uh, no, you <laughs> no, uh, So I couldn't relate to that type of entre entrepreneur. That was not mm -hmm. me. But I liked what technology could do to people, and I liked what society would become with technology. So it's completely different things. And I saw these in large companies as well. These people, not in basements. Mm. But we also went out on the city, weren't, uh, asking people, what do they think about? Yeah, we, we, we sent a film team and just took random people and asked them, what's an entrepreneur? Can we play the video, please? When I say the word entrepreneur, what do you think? I'm someone who is new thinking and that don't want to be stuck in today's things. I think he's a very busy man. Did I? Yeah. I'm so sorry. I meant he or she or it or whatever. Whatever. <laughs> you see, it's still in my mind that it's a he. Between men and women in this aspect, I think both are equally entrepreneurial, and if they if, if they're equally creative, I don't see see any difference in that. The bloggers are the are mostly girls, and well, they are there. You have a lot of girly entrepreneurs, and I think that's kind of important as well to see that they also are entrepreneurs, not only like the men that are sitting in by their desks. Like people all around us are entrepreneurs. We just don't think about them that way. Wow, wow, wouldn't you say? But actually, everybody can't start their own businesses, and you don't need to. You can have a good career in self-development in existing companies also. We have very many people with passion working like entrepreneurs in existing company, big organizations. And I think actually that the companies, they depend on this. They depend on having employees who really feel passion for their work and for, for the, what they do at their job. And that's why we'll have four women right here right now who love the job and therefore is an indispensable force for the companies. We'll come on stage, Lisa Parfelt, difference maker at Spotify. Yeah, right. Anna Wikland, industry head at Google. Alexandra Drevenlid, CTIO at Tele2. And Lina Bromeus, COO, Content MTDX and Viaplay. Please have a seat.
Mindset. We are going to talk about your jobs and how fantastic they are. So please just have one minute to tell us all what do you do at work? Well, um, I have been working at Spotify for six months now, and my title at Spotify is Difference Maker. What does that mean? <laughs> exactly. I <laughs> thought everyone do? is probably wondering that right now. Um, but I have the fortune to be working very closely with our CEO. Um, and by doing that, I get a very broad view of our company as a whole. Um, additionally to that, I'm during my first year uh, as a part of the executive team as well. So um, I get even more broad um, uh, exposure by being there. And I think that due to my holistic view and my new perspective of coming in, uh, that's where I can make the more, most difference. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And Anna? Yeah, what do you I, do at work? Exactly. So uh, my title is industry head uh, at uh, Google, and that means that I am in charge of uh, the retail technology and telecom sector uh, within the, the business segment at Google, focusing on our online marketing products. Mm. Alexandra? Just go on trying. Like this, yeah. I think. Uh, I'm the CTIO with Tele2 Sweden. I've been working with Tele2 for 13 years. And uh, I'm responsible for all the mobile networks, the fixed networks. So when we're talking about the mobile networks, it's 2G, 3G and 4G in Sweden. And also with, uh, uh, I'm re responsible for all the consumer and the business to business delivery and provisioning. And, uh, and also, in addition to that, uh, I'm uh, responsible for all the IT system and building platforms here in Sweden. Mm -hmm. So when our phones doesn't work, we need to call you. Is that well, so? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. You should call me then. Yeah. Well, if uh, possible, if yeah, they were working. If, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, please tell us what do you do at work. Lina? So I'm responsible for all of our content across MDS and IMP. Mike, does it work? work? No, it's something. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Mm. Okay. So I'm responsible for all our content across Viaplay and MTDX, which means that I go to Hollywood to find new content partners, to identify new content distributors. I negotiate rights with different studios, I determine different distribution strategies, how we're supposed to optimize all of our content assets across our platforms. and. I watched a fair amount of television as well, I have to say. I can imagine. <laughs> You're the one who decides what to see here. Yes, and today we're actually also live broadcasting Women in Tech, which is absolutely amazing. Mm. Indeed. Yes. <laughs> yes. Close. Then, what would you say is the most fantastic thing about your job? And don't say everything, <laughs> because we, we realize that, but anyway. What is most fantastic with, with networks, Alexandra? I think working with the telecom sector, I think it's the most fantastic that you are working within a business that is within the forefront of technology and that is a fast moving business and uh, you never get bored. And uh, also when we're talking about, uh, since I'm working with all the technicians at work, I think it's fantastic to be among the crowd of technicians and the technical department. I really love that. Okay. What do you say? Well, I think I would say that the most fantastic part of my work is that we as a company uh, make a product that can make a difference to people's lives and even possibly change behaviors. Um, and I think that's a really amazing thing to be part of. Just imagine that um, every, every moment you are in, in your life, you have a certain mode. And if we can strengthen that mode with some music, I think that's fantastic. And we, we do not only bring that music to you, but we also change the way of how you can listen to music. Mm -hmm. And these are the things that we do every day. So we actually create the soundtrack of your lives. 
And now you can also like create your own soundtrack by using the features, mm -hmm. like creating your own playlist. And I think those are the things that are so amazing that we actually can come up with ideas that can change how people live their lives and bring a me ad adding meaningful value to them. What do you say, Anna? What is so fantastic with, with your job at Google? I think uh, my answer will be like threefolded because there are like different dimensions that I really love. Um, if we look at like the broad perspective, working for a fantastic company like Google, it's really about the products, I mean the, the search engine and YouTube and so forth, but also like the, the bigger initiatives that Google drives uh, based on, on uh, and can, can do based on technology like uh, Project Loom, which is a project that we do to try to get uh, internet to rural parts of the world that, is, that are really hard to get to, so that more people can get connectivity, get medical help, can get information and so forth, that sort of thing, to know that I'm part of a company that do those types of things. Uh, You're actually trying to connect the whole world then with yeah, I guess so, by, by now trying to send up balloons uh, in balloons. the stratosphere that is cruising around uh, with wireless internet. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's really cool. And then I also love, um, since I'm on the business uh, side of, of uh, Google's business, we work with uh, a lot of companies and, and really help them uh, digitalize their organizations and really try to help them uh, with exponential growth and, and finding their spot in the future, uh, which is uh, really motivating. And then um, the third thing is to work with fantastic people in my team and at Google as a whole. Uh, it's not only me that is really loving my work, it's most people at Google are like that. Mm -hmm. To really work with my team and see how I can help them grow and, and do things they love mm. uh, is the third part that I truly just love about it. But I think this with you knowing so much about us and that is helping the companies to evolve the services that we need and get rid of those that we really don't need. Uh, is, is that the mission that you, can you see that happen? Uh, that you can provide the companies with this data about uh, human behavior. You're almost like a thermometer of, of the world's uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's one of the things that I think is really fascinating if you look at uh, everything that we know based on, on uh, Google search engine. I mean, that, that is really like a, like a thermometer on like the, the, the global demand in different areas. Mm -hmm. What are people searching for? It can be like new products, but it can also be the that, that we can, can look at to and understand when the ne next flu season is coming mm -hmm. because people are starting to search for, for things around that. And, and to help companies then uh, uh, to break that information down uh, within the areas that are interesting to them uh, and help buy insights growing their businesses is really mm -hmm. interesting, I think. Mm -hmm. Lena, what is the fabulous, most fantastic things with, with your, your job, except for watching a lot of TV. Except for <laughs> that. <laughs> no, I, I do have an absolutely amazing job, but I think the, one of the key fundamentals of it is to be part of, of driving the digital shift and the digital transformation that the media industry is in the middle of now, to see what we can achieve and what we can manage to do within our platforms. And mm. just looking at 2014, I mean, we managed to broadcast Olympics, we put a lot of efforts towards our kids viewing, which resulted in like a 700% increase, and we exclusively premiered the first online series who ever won a Golden Globe. So to see those results and to be in the forefront of driving that is absolutely incredible. And to do that with the incredible staff that we have, it's, uh, it's amazing. Is that what drives you? Is that what, you know, gets you going? I think what results. really, yeah, my, I think the results really is what, what the key driver to be part of the value chain, to be part of identifying a constant a asset like transparent, to negotiate the rights, to secure the distribution for it, then premiering it and just seeing the, the title becoming a massive success and see the viewers finding it and, and to transform the, uh, the, the ways that we distribute all the content that we have. Hmm. Alexander, what is your key driver? What, what gets you going? 
Uh, I would say primarily in, uh, in delivering results. Uh, uh, I think it's, uh, results is it's, uh, it's key for me. I, I need to see that we are able to deliver on the, on the targets and our, our ambitions, uh, ambitious goals. And also to see that we are, so to say, working with all the people within the company and see that we are maybe making changes or, or developments. And, uh, for example, we implemented a new change of mindset and see the result with that one. It's a little bit more softer issues than more like uh, figures and facts in, in that sense. But I think... Uh, General to well, be that's able development. To see. Definitely, mm -hmm. definitely, and uh, uh, to see the results in in the way I'm working. Results is that what what uh, gets you going as well, or what are you, what what gets you going? I would say that seeing the results through our customers, like delivering that to them, it's a way of result. Mm. Uh, also, to complete a project um, is a result as well. So. Of course, I'm driven by result, but I think you can see them in different, different ways as well. Mm. Meeting the customers is one of your driving forces, then. Sorry? Meeting the customers is also one of... Absolutely. A big, mm. I think so. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree that you can see results in different ways. I love results. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I love to compete. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so, and you can do that in so many different ways, but... In my own role, results is about making our clients uh, succeed in a more connected digital world. That's fantastic. But mm -hmm. at Google, it can also be more about really making sure that we build the best products for our users, uh, which is another dimension that is really, really interesting, I think. Mm. But, you know, we all have good and bad days, isn't it so? Even if we have a fantastic job, uh, we have bad moods as well. What gets you bored? <laughs> Are you never bored? I, yeah, I, I get bored uh, uh, if, if uh, it sometimes gets to be too much admin work for me, when I don't get out there to meet with the customers and people overall. Mm. Um, and that, how do that you can get out of that? Me. Sorry? When, how do you get yourself out of that? To, you know, to find your passion again, and fuel up with energy. Yeah, well, it's, it's pretty good to work at a company like Google then, because then if you try to think of ways to, to do things uh, smarter and, and uh, with more uh, technology to, to really do them data-driven instead of like manually, uh, then, then uh, I can get more stuff out of the way. So connect to the right people and, and try to come up with uh, more automated processes. Uh, mm. has helped me quite a bit during the last year, mm. actually. What do you other say? What is the thing that, you know, gets you really bored or, and in a mode that you won't go anywhere? And what gets you up from there? What are the tough times? What well, gets you up? Yeah, I would say that I get bored when it, things move too slow and when you get stuck and when you just loop things around and around and you can't see any progress with it. Mm. Um, that's when I get bored and I think it's really important to bring some humor into your work as well. Mm. So that's why I would say like get shit done and have fun. It's very important. Mm. A good tip. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And... Uh, um, I remember that. I think it's a great way. If you can bring some humor in and then I think you just like take a step back. Um, you don't always have to overcomplicate things. A lot of the times, like, common sense is very underestimated. So just, like, can we solve this in a great way? Can we do it now? And can we bring some fun into it? And then move on. And then hopefully not get stuck in the same process again. Mm. Alexandra? Yeah. I totally agree with you. I think it's also, I mean, something that gets me bored is also when something gets stuck, then you, you can't get, you can't uh, move forward uh, or, or if something gets too bureaucratic or too political. But, um, so, uh, I think that's, uh, my personal view is that I'm very pragmatic and I think it's, uh, Sometimes you need to slice up the elephant or you need to find other ways in working uh, to make workarounds and get things going and I think that's really, really important. 
You have been working in Tele2 for, for 13 years, as you said earlier. Um, how do you keep up your passion for that? Is it like a good marriage, you know? It's, the longer you stay, the more fundamental the passion grows? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know about that, actually. But, <laughs> yeah. but uh, yes, I've been working with Tele2 for, uh, for 13 years, and it's been like uh, 13 very fun years, I would say. And, uh, uh, and I'm a very devoted and dedicated person with, uh, with lots of energy. And I think the thing with during my 13 years uh, at Tele2 is that I've never been bored in that sense. So I've always uh, got the opportunity to, to learn new things, uh, get new challenges and uh, get my career moving, so to say. So I think uh, that's have been one of the bigger things. So that is what you would recommend the company leaders who are sitting here and having trouble with keeping their talent, give them new opportunities? Or how do you keep your, your staff that wants, that, that wants to develop? I would say, uh, I would say to, to be able to see the opportunities and the potential in all the individuals, I would say that. And also don't be afraid to, to promote people uh, to new position, new challenges and, uh, and so forth. I think that's very important. And uh, both for yourself and for your colleagues and for your employees, I think it's, it's very important to, to be brave and to dare to win and try new things. and. and uh, and get things going in, in different directions. Mm. You all have uh, people to lead as well, employees. How do you get their talent to grow and for their own self-development, but also for the company's good? I think it's incredibly important to, to give them ownership. I mean, I have a tremendously talented team and what we try to do is that we give them ownership, we give them clear mandate, we give them responsibility. We, we let them know that we are always going to be there to keep their back if, if something happens, but they're in charge. They're absolutely in charge and they're the ones who drives our business forward. And they're the key components of our success. And it's tremendously important that we find and identify and, and lead these young talents forward because they're going to be the future of our success as well. So, yeah, ownership. What do you say? I definitely agree, it's ownership and also uh, that all the individuals can feel the responsibility in what they are doing, but also to make everybody included and in, involved in, in all the different processes in the decision making. And uh, t uh, by that also get engaged uh, employees by being very clear and transparent with your targets and the goals. Uh, and. I mean, where we're heading and uh, the short and long term targets. Oh, and of course, with a big heart, I, I think it's very important to see the individuals, as I said, with the potentials uh, and uh, all, all the people. I think Anna? it's important to, to uh, or uh, the way we work and, and I try to work is to uh, really understand both like what their personal goals are and professional goals to really help them uh, grow in both areas, because sometimes they are correlated, sometimes they are not, but uh, to, to really be whole and to really, really like be inspired and like your work, I think that's important. Uh, and also I really believe in uh, giving a lot of freedom, like setting a clear vision where we're heading, but really leave it uh, to them to, to do it in their way and then be available as much as possible to, to help them when, when they need uh, help. I totally agree with that. I also believe that autonomy is super crucial and autom autonomy with a clear mission. Um, I think that also allows um, the people around you to let out of their creativity even more. Mm. Um, so I would say that's very, very important. Mm. And you said earlier that this is absolutely crucial for the companies that we manage this flourishing of, of talent yes. and passion at our employees. Anybody against? No. <laughs> no, I guess so. Thanks for sharing all this with us, for your passion for your companies and in your careers. Thank Give you. Give them an applause. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Hello.
Hello. Fantastic. I love change makers. Mm. And it, it's, so, it's so cool that it can be in large companies, small companies, or they can be alone in front of a video camera on YouTube. So it's, it's, it's super cool that mm. creation comes in different shapes and forms. Indeed. What has driven you when you started your companies? When I, well, the first company was I realized nobody would ever hire me. It was 91. And since then, I've never fired myself. But, but, <laughs> <laughs> but be better reasons could be that you're really angry about something because it's wrong and it should be done better or that you really want to uh, solve a problem. Uh, my, my, another reason, which if you ask the question, what if, and then you start answering it, mm. or even wouldn't it be cool if... That's how we started Syme. Wouldn't it be cool if we could invite anybody in the world and learn from them? Who would you want to learn from? And then that becomes something. But why did you start a company? I was actually just about to say that I haven't. But, but I have actually, since I one year ago uh, took off as a freelancer. So I actually have started a company since I've been an employee for, for ever. <laughs> earlier but, but and how does that, that is, feel yeah but that is good that is really good actually that's I, I think that the driving forces for me here is about the same thing that drives me in my profession the curiosity the the willing to help people tell their stories the uh, the fantastic uh, opportunity to ask people questions um, telling news but also helping people to telling their stories to put the finger on the right spot and uh, well, like we do here today, actually. But you, uh, would you say that you were less or more passionate when you were working for Vekan Safar than when you're uh, working now, or is it the same? It's different, but it's the same. No, but I it understand actually, perfectly. That is no, but I, I really understand perfectly. I think yeah. you're as passionate as a storyteller, but maybe you like the freedom better, mm. or it's different in mm. a sense. When you're working in an organization, you have a team, you have a, a co-project that mm. you drive, and, and you want to do this, and you have a goal. Uh, I was working there very much with uh, Näringslivets Mäktigaste Kvinnor, and that's Veckans Affairs Gender Equality uh, Program. And to, have, to be a, a team and work to a goal, that's fantastic. But also now, when I'm building my own company, that's also fantastic, because I have to to find out, well, what do I want to do? If I can do anything I want to, who do I want to work with? Mm -hmm. What do I want to accomplish in the world? And that's brilliant. Do you worry more when you're an entrepreneur? Mm -hmm. Do you worry more when you're an entrepreneur? Yes and no, actually, because I have <laughs> the mandate. Are you a politician? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but maybe, maybe, well, maybe that's a thought. <laughs> no, but it's, it's because I, I know I have the mandate of my life. Mm. So that makes me uh, not so worried. Mm. Because when I was in the organization, you know, you had to do this. And this must be done. And this and this and this. But, but now I can feel, well, this must be done. And this and this and this. But... I can do it whenever I want. Mm. I was told when I started my first company, somebody said, oh, so you're an entrepreneur. Congratulations. They sleep like babies. And I thought that looked, sounded very encouraging. And then the person said, well, they wake up every hour and cry for food. <laughs> 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 anyway, what we would like to do now is that you turn around to the person next to you. Hopefully, it's somebody you don't know. You shake hands in a very polite, polite way. Wait, wait, not right now. Uh, and then you share for just a minute what you're deeply passionate about. And once we've done that, when both parties have done that, uh, you can take your newfound friend, and we have some coffee outside, and we also have a lot of interesting people yes, you can meet. Yes, we do. Because if you want to learn more about how it is to work in this tech industry, we also have the organizers out here at the stairs. They will be there. They will ask any question you want to, to uh, ask them and tell you all about how it is to be working at these companies and in this business. And the, uh, this is not a, an official break. This is just a sort of network working, stretch your legs, check out the place kind of break. So it's only 10 minutes. We will have more and longer breaks later with all kinds of things happening. So turn around to the person next to you. Don't forget to be polite. <laughs> oh, OK. Welcome back. Welcome back. And a big round of applause for our DJ, Maria from Sahara Hot Nights. Yay! What, what an energy level. If, if somebody could just bottle the energy here and sell it in little cans, all the energy drinks would be out of business in no time. Yeah, uh, definitely. <laughs> I think it was amazing how we, when we 
when we said, well, it's time for a break, please start a conversation with the neighbor, you just, <laughs> the conversation is just too far. Oh, it was and, and, and I promised coffee, and then uh, Sandra said, there is no coffee. And nobody even asked for coffee out there. So I think that's <laughs> a good testament to the conversations. Yeah. Maybe there's even been born some companies here today. Who knows? We were it would be interesting to know. Please we were tell discussing us. That. <gasps> we, we were discussing that in the break. How many companies are connected here? How many people would work with each other? So in 10 years from now, if one could see all the connections being made in this break, it would be very, very interesting. Mm. Please contact us and tell us if that happens. Absolutely. Then you, are, you have a place here on stage 10 years from now where you can brag about how you did it. Um, take a deep breath, everybody. Oxygen. Breathe out. Because it's never going to be so slow again as it is right now. From now on, change is only going to be faster and faster and faster until we die. Mm -hmm. Would you like to be somebody that is attacked by change or somebody that is part of Steering leading the change. the change? Leading the change, actually. That is who we're going to talk to now. Three eminent persons who are leading change uh, in their businesses and in this business, the tech and media business. I'll introduce them. Are you Thank you very much. Rest? Constant change. That is one of the things that really defines this business tech and media. And change is also what we want. We want change because we want to change things. We want to build a place in this business where, e where everybody can work and be their se themselves. And to discuss this, I have three brilliant persons here with me today. Very welcome to Ulrika Saxon, CEO at Bonnie Growth Media, who converts She is converting an old publishing company to the digital era. Have a seat. And she's investing over a hundred million, uh, millions a year in new projects, searching for the Bonnie's business in the new times. And also welcome Jennifer Rosten, head of growth and culture at Netlight, that manages the growth of an equal company culture and a company being a role model in this business to making it a good place for both men and women. And Douglas Roos, multi-entrepreneur and founder of Nyheter 24. And very welcome. Will you sit down? Hi. Okay. One of those yeah. important <laughs> men <laughs> who drives the gender issue on the barricades <laughs> while changing industries and making money. Give them a round of applause, everybody together. You know, when I think of change, I think of disruption. And uh, that change always originates from disruption in one way or another. Douglas, you have uh, gone into different businesses, betting, news, and you break down the structures, and then you build up new ones. How important sometimes, is yeah. it? <laughs> okay, sometimes. Yeah. Uh, how important is disruption for changing? Well, as you say, I think it's uh, decisive. Um, um, and I think the uh, originator of the disruption, disruption is, is the most important um, person or um, the, um, character in this uh, drama because it's important that there is a person that, needs, uh, that, that, that dares to take the unusual steps mm -hmm. and dares to be unconventional. Uh, and, and it was interesting now that you mentioned that uh, you promised coffee to everyone before the break. Mm -hmm. and 1,000 people, you go out there and there was no coffee there. Mm -hmm. And you, can, you come back, uh, Ola thought it was uh, very good. I don't think it was good actually. I would, like to, and, and I, I would like you to scream and yell and demand your coffee because you were promised coffee. <laughs> you know? It's not okay, you should not accept these things. You know? <laughs> she didn't like that. No, I doesn't agree. Okay, we have you to yell more. <laughs> yeah, yell okay. more. Uh, you have to be a protester then. Yeah, you, you need, need, you need, need to demand, to you know, you're mm. a person, demand your rights, uh, dare to stand up for what you think uh, is right and what you want, mm. and uh, choose your own path. Don't choose the, the same path as everyone else. Uh, Upptrampa de stigar, as we say in Swedish. And, anyone here that doesn't understand Swedish, by the way? 
No? Ah, one. Okay. Okay, that's good. <laughs> we'll have a conversation <laughs> so, later. Uh, <laughs> so don't walk in up tramp or stegar. You can ask your neighbor. They would ask me. <laughs> yeah. Choose your uh, own path. <laughs> true, true. But I think you're right because the more disruptive you are in your idea, the more power or energy you need to put in the change. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you sure. need to yell more if you want something really awkward. So maybe yeah. coffee you can just ask for. Yeah. And, and then if you want something really strange, you need to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's an age thing. Okay, I'm not going to speak too much now because I know that there are more people here in this panel, but it's an age thing also. I, the older I get, the more... Uh, coffee uh, dependent we get. The, the, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> exactly. The more coffee I need, <laughs> yeah. the more coffee I get also because I demand it. Mm. Uh, so it's, uh, if, if, if we can teach you to take these steps uh, faster than I did, uh, then, uh, then uh, we did something good because uh, but, oh, demand your uh, rights. Uh, I know, sorry, I, sorry. Uh, I, I, I hate to <laughs> take your job, but I, I, can I just ask him a question? Are you noticing the disruption? I have something <laughs> to say <laughs> as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, you used to be disruptive. You're an entrepreneur. But do you also think that you need to listen a lot? Or do you think that to be disruptive, you actually should listen a little bit less? Less. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I, I he needs to be less. But you you disruptive. should listen, of course, you know, and, and you should follow your MO group. You can ask mm -hmm. what else. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you, you really, really uh, don't listen too much because if you listen too much, if you're going to start up a company and you listen to all your friends and all the uh, uh, no sayers and all the important people and all the experts and all the intelligent ones, then you're never going to start this company. You know, you you uh, you need to listen and of course uh, and. So, sort of value the information that you get, uh, but don't value it too much. That, that's, that's, my, uh, that's my recipe, you know. But that's an interesting question because what we also are, are talking about here is uh, mindsets. Coffee, well, there wasn't any, any, we don't care. And Jennifer, you are working very much with changing mindsets uh, yes. because you're working with uh, increasing gender equality in this tech business. And we really have some work to do here, I think. That's why we're here today, actually. And when you do that, what do you need to tear down in order to build something new up? Equal mindsets in culture and people's minds. Uh, I think you... Well, first of all, you need to tear down the norms and structures that we, that we have. It's not a coincidence that it looks like it does uh, today. Uh, and I don't think, uh, what I was going to say before, I don't think that it might be an age thing, uh, this about demanding uh, things or listening too much or something. I think it's also uh, a matter of uh, a privilege thing and you need to be aware of, uh, of who you are and how you build up the context and the surroundings for everyone to, to be heard mm. um, because that is not at all uh, what the climate is out there today. So we need to tear down all the privileges we have built up us for well, ourselves? Well, we need to tear down the norms and structures, and, uh, and uh, we have a lot of work to do there. I don't know if you saw, but uh, just this week, the Albright report came out. They, uh, they, uh, every, the, every year, they examine the, uh, the companies, uh, the listed companies in Sweden, uh, how the management and the, uh, the board structure uh, is. And, uh, well, this time, I think uh, last year's report, they said that if we're going on in this pace, we will have equal teams in 2041. And uh, now they say we will have it in 2063. So in one year, we have added 22 years until mm -hmm. we are equal. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, I think we have, um, okay, I'm being the cynical one here. We had so many great inspirational <laughs> thing, uh, speakers today, mm -hmm. but we need to see what it looks like that is not just here at Women in Tech or this week where the 8th of March, March uh, is because uh, 22 out of uh, how many is there 266 uh, CEOs um, are women we had I think 71 companies with zero women in the management and Anders is of course still more common in management uh, okay. especially in tech than being a woman so I mean, we, we really need to see these structures and then we need to set examples and uh, role models and uh, like we do here today. But, mm. we, but that's we, too vague. We need to do that. I mean, no, we, that's we, not no, too we, vague. We've been seeing this. But we will discuss this, this more, more later. I just uh, want to hear from Ulrike first. <laughs> Please, Mr. Did, did you turn you off my to... microphone? <laughs> no, I didn't. You are to turn it yourself. I just want to say that it was too vague. Uh, we need to do something. But I want to hear from Ulrike first. In your job... You should listen. No, that's scouting new business. <laughs> Hey! <laughs> Disruption, okay? What do you need to tear down 
to see the new trends in the, this old Bonnier business, what do you need to do to, to find the yeah, new things? Uh, we're on a route where we need to transform a lot, and it's been going on for years, but we're just putting even more focus on it now. So it's not, a, it's not as much what to do than how to do it. Mm -hmm. And we definitely need to tear down in a media publishing house like Bonnier uh, the thought that content is content on is king. Or on queen. In, in, in we need to move the limelight from, from content to tech yeah. to be much more tech driven and tech focused in every aspect we can. Mm. The thing is, how do we build something up? When we, once we have teared down all these mindsets, uh, all these structures in the businesses, how do we build things up from there? The 10 million question. <laughs> yeah, the 10 million dollar yeah. question. Million dollar question. I think we need, we need to set examples, like we're doing here today. We need to change the norms. For example, we, um, just this week at my company, uh, uh, there were an email sent out saying, hi everyone, it's springtime, it's March, we're doing the green March. Uh, we're having vegetarian as uh, the norm this month and, and uh, hopefully even longer. Uh, if you want to eat meat, of course you can eat. You just have to tick the box that the vegetarians otherwise have to tick. Okay, so that's quite an easy, I think it's brilliant. I think it's such a, it's a small example, but it's, but it's really, really easy way to, to change a norm. And uh, if you change one, it's easier to change, uh, change many. So, uh, I mean, yeah, that, that's one way. And then you need to think about who you, who you put up on stage, of course, uh, who you uh, put out there to represent the company, who you, how you work with your incentive models, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You actually have a quite a cool thing, I think, in your contracts at NetLight. Yeah. But you have a, a, a thing in your contract, a writing in your contract that says that we presume that everybody is equally treated. And to, to fail on that one is, Possibly to break the contract. Yes. Is it so? Yes, that is. Have so. you ever uh, done that? We have, <laughs> we have the contract with our clients. Uh, we also have a contract within uh, Netlight that mm -hmm. uh, we need to sign. I mean, everyone needs to sign off for our policy, how we work and how we treat each other, which is very uh, concrete. It's like, okay, you shake hands or you hug. I mean, it's on, it's on that level. Uh, so we treat each other uh, equally. But yeah, this is with our clients. That, uh, since we are a consultant company, people that work at NetLight have two uh, working sites. They're not in the, comp uh, in the office uh, within NetLight's world, but they are out with our clients, of course. And we want the environment there to be as mm. good. Uh, as so that's a kind of yeah. statement, and it's also a, a Absolutely, yeah. juridical thing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Can I say something there? Yeah, If please. you tear down an, an old structure and want to rebuild something new, the people that do that, they really need to be self-confident and they need to trust the team that do it because they're going to have lots of people saying that, hey, you're changing something that we used to 1,000 years here uh, and, and, and this is the best system. How can you put something new in, in, uh, in order? And then you need to be really tough. You need to be self-confident. You need to trust the people that you work with and you need to believe in yourself. So and that's, how do that's, we build that's that crucial. Trust? That's really crucial yeah. in this process. Yeah. Or, or you could also create an environment that is, I, we have a saying at NetLight, say, all this ugly, make it new. <laughs> and if you, if you know that uh, you can walk around and everyone is saying, all this ugly, make it new, uh, you can't have anyone sit back and say, you know what, I've done this for 20 years and it's been fine, so why are you coming here with new ideas? Mm. You say, all this ugly, make it new. Everyone has to do that. We hire new mm. people, we hire young people, we have to listen to them to be the company for tomorrow because mm. uh, uh, so we have to create an environment for people not necessarily having to be um, that self-confident. Uh, we have to give everyone space to, to uh, share kind their voice. Yeah. to make trust. Yes. That is so true with media, media houses as well. I mean, we need to create free zones like uh, space for growth and uh, giving, giving all the resources there are to those companies. That it's, it's not a coincidence that legacy media brands don't really make it when they mm -hmm. try to d disrupt their own business models mm -hmm. under the legacy That's brands. That's hard. That's really because hard. Because it's extremely challenging. You mm -hmm. need to change not only the way you're thinking about the business, you need to think, uh, think up a new disruptive business plan, convince the owners, the investors, and also move the brand in the customer minds. Mm -hmm. So there's no, it's no coincidence that the, the disruptors are called Spotify, Uber, BuzzFeed, or Ad Libris, if you like, because mm. they started on, with, on, on a standalone basis with new, a new brand mm. and uh, a free zone to, to grow 
without thinking so much about being a, a poisoned core, from the core, old yeah, order. Yeah, I see. And, and but that makes this challenge I want to talk about now really, really be good because it's impossible to do that in what I'm going to tell you now. It is the very world we're living in. Um, this very week, there was a new startup tech site uh, launched. It's called Break It. And they have one of their big news in the first, uh, first uh, week that they investigated the representation of the women in the management of the 10 largest Swedish tech companies based on employees, a uh, number of employees and turnover. And nine out of 10 board members were men. No woman is president. At the peak positions, CEO, CTO, and CFO, we have one out of 10 female. This is not a very big uh, base. It's only 10 companies. And there's a lot of natural historical explanations in, in forms of that uh, who founded the company and so on. But let's not talk about why. Let's talk about how we change that. And we have to change this in the communities where we are living. What do you say, Douglas? You are one of those men who really got on the um, barricades for, for the gender issue. How do we change this? Um, that's, of course, the one billion uh, bit Bitcoin question. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but first, I just want to say the, the reason why uh, I want change, there are two reasons, and we spoke about that before this uh, little panel here. It, uh, and First of all, of course, equality. You know, it, there is an obvious discrimination going on right now. Uh, but secondly, uh, it's uh, economy. I think um, I think um, I think that we actually will make more money, basically, in Swedish uh, in Sweden. Mm. Companies will make more money. And how to change this? Well, first of all, uh, I'm 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 very much for legislation. And that's uh, when you turned off my microphone here ten minutes ago. That's what I wanted to say. Uh, <laughs> but now I finally <laughs> can now say it. Thank you very yes, much. Yes, please. Um, and what I mean is that I think okay, we've been discussing mm -hmm. this question now for so long, for 20 years or whatever, 25 or longer, you know, and, and there's, it doesn't, nothing happens. Mm. So if, uh, and I, I don't think that the... But the, that's a good how. The decision makers, I don't think that they're evil or whatever, but you know, look at my network. They're most, mostly guys, people that I grew up with and played football or whatever, and uh, we studied together, and you know, when I need some for, someone for a board uh, appointment, I spoke to them because I know them. So I think uh, legislation is uh, one of the keys. And I, th I think actually two uh, pieces of legislation would be very, very good. First of all, uh, we have the quotering. Quotes. 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 Mm. Quotas. Quotas uh, uh, for, the, for the stock exchange uh, mm. companies. The largest uh, 260 mm. stock exchange companies. I think there should be a 40-60 relation in one way or the other. Mm. And, and secondly, which I think that I believe, but I haven't really decided yet, is to put a quote also on the uh, uh, parental, for checking. Mm. parental insurance. Parental yeah. leave, uh, blah, blah, blah. Exactly. Mm. <coughs> I, because, because for me, it's so obvious, you know, uh, that um, a, a woman who is 27, 28, 29, she's normally more educated uh, than a man who, who is the same age. Uh, and uh, she's, uh, just, her, her career is just about to take off. Um, and then she, she becomes pregnant, which is That's the most best thing that can happen. That's actually a you know? kind of children's rights issue as well, because a, chi a child has a right to his father as much as uh, to his mother. Yeah, but so don't, uh, let's, the, the kids, are, I mean, they're well taken care of. Don't forget <laughs> about them. But uh, that takes six, six months each, I think. Mm. Uh, and if you don't want to put your kid uh, with the father for the remaining six months, then go to the uh, crash. Mm. I, I, I that's the good thing about break yeah. structures, <laughs> legislation, because we, maybe we cannot trust ourselves in that. Uh, let's talk about the human f factor. Yeah. Uh, it's too weak. We maybe need some jurisdiction here. What do you say, the how? The how. Well, uh, mm. I absolutely agree with you uh, there. That's why I had a year of working with politics, uh, actually, last mm. year as well. But how, I think it's... Uh, it, meanwhile, uh, we work on that track, and uh, meanwhile, I mean, we are entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs, we can actually create the, the reality that we want. Mm. Uh, and that's what this sure. is about, I think. Uh, we, we create what environment do we want, what norms do we build in our company, and then we can, uh, I mean, spread that to the world. But, but as uh, company founders and leaders and uh, uh, co-workers and everything, we can, uh, I mean, we decide. We decide the incentive model. We decide who recruits and uh, who do we recruit and who, 
uh, I mean, take this Green March example. If we have put that in the, the partner board for up for discussion, we will sit, yeah, okay, how do you think people will react if they don't get meat? And how do you think this will happen? And so, and so, and so. Instead, just do it. So let people do it, create an environment of, uh, of uh, letting people Supportive. do things. And, yeah, and let people fail as well, mm -hmm. because that is also important. Rika? Yeah, I don't, know the about the I don't know about the legislation, but maybe you're right. But if, if so, it's also kind of depressing that it should have to go that way. I agree with you. And it is depressing <laughs> when you mention the statistics, mm -hmm. but I, I still think that there are a lot of things happening. Mm -hmm. And I mean, an initiative like this, we just need to do more, and we, did, we need to do more on, on all the levels, from preschool up through all grades, to universities, to business labs, up to top management, boards, politicians. We need to do so much more. But, and I think that um, the, the maybe one most depression, depressive mm -hmm. figure is about ownership. I just heard mm -hmm. um, to what part women actually own assets in this world. I mean, it's, it's not, obviously it's not 50%, it's not 40. Do you know how, how, how little it is? 10? One. Four. Four, four. four. four percent. Mm. So that's obviously that's why the, the makes me very glad power is somewhere else. Exactly. It makes me very happy that you say that, because that's what we're going to talk about yes. uh, coming up here right now. Yeah, and we need to Give inspire them an women to fo be founders and owners and no, entrepreneurs. No. Much good. More. Very good. Please an applause for this <laughs> splendid, disruptive <laughs> panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent panel. And uh, to all of our uh, viewers on VI Play, our international uh, audience, the grumpy old man here was Douglas Roos, if you missed that. If you want to teach him English, buy him a cup of coffee. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Turn up the mic. In, but make sure there is coffee, okay? Um, I prefer a bun as well. No, but just change making. It's not the how. I think most of us, it's not the what. Most of us get something needs to be done, mm. but it's the how. Mm. Uh, and, and um, you know, when, when, when you look at leadership, before it used to be like being an orchestrator with a perfect orchestra, and everybody knew what they were doing and there were processes. I think now it's more like being part of a jam session and trying mm. to figure out what's happening in real time. And that's a completely different type of leadership. Exactly. And th that's a lot about timing, I think. That you, that you clock in where you need to get things done, you just feel that it needs to get done, and you do it. And it's also about getting started early. Yeah, and, the, the, and I think also changing things and questioning things earlier on, uh, kind of like the panel was discussing here. And we're going to look at we're going to look at a movie that I think has a couple of interesting components. Many of you have already seen it, but it's an important movie. Mm -hmm. So I think we Indeed. should roll it. Yeah, we do. Show like me what a it girl. looks like to run like a girl. My hair. Oh my God. Show me what it looks like to fight like a girl. <laughs> Now throw like a girl. Aw. My name is Dakota and I'm 10 years old. Show me what it looks like to run like a girl. Throw like a girl. Fight like a girl. What does it mean to you when I say run like a girl? It means Run fast as you can. So do you think you just insulted your sister? No. I mean, yeah, insulted girls, but not my sister. Mm. Is like a girl a good thing? Actually, I don't know what it really, if it's a bad thing or a good thing. It sounds like a bad thing. It sounds like you're trying to humiliate someone. So when they're in that vulnerable time, between 10 and 12, how do you think it affects them when somebody uses like a girl as an insult? I think it definitely drops their self-confidence and um, really puts them down because during that time they're already trying to figure themselves out. And when somebody says you hit like a girl, it's like, well, what does that mean? Because they think they're a strong person. It's kind of like telling them that they're weak and they're not as good as them. 
And what advice do you have to young girls who are told they run like a girl, kick like a girl, hit like a girl, swing like a girl? Keep doing it because it's working. If somebody else says that running like a girl or kicking like a girl or shooting like a girl is something that you shouldn't be doing, that's their problem. Because if you're still scoring and you're still getting to the ball on time and you're still being first, you're doing it right. It doesn't matter what they say. I mean, yes, I kick like a girl and I swim like a girl and I walk like a girl and I wake up in the morning like a girl because I am a girl. And that's not something that I should be ashamed of. So I'm going to do it anyway. That's what they should do. If I asked you to, to run like a girl now, would you do it differently? I would run like myself. Would you like a chance to redo it? So, and I think, I think this is interesting in two dimensions. One is a commercial dimension. Here is a company that takes an issue and they tell a story and it's all over the world, not because they pay for it, but because people care. But more importantly, it challenges invisible things that create a system uh, that I think is very dangerous. I think we also need to start very, very early. So the next panel is about the early adopters. And we're going to start by inviting Isabella from Kids Hack Day. Very welcome. Please have a seat. Paulina, who's uh, an instigator of lots of interesting thoughts. She's part of Geek Girls Meetups. She's an advisor in strategy, and she really is an industry commentator that cares about gender. Please, Paulina, take the stage. The next speaker is connected to a really cool institution, Chalmers, and they do all kinds of entrepreneurial programs and invest in, and so forth. And I'm a mentor there as well. But she's created Startup Birds for focusing on VC and entrepreneurship for women. Sophia, welcome up on stage. <laughs> Fantastic, what a crowd, huh? Yeah, amazing. <laughs> so, uh, Starting out with, with Kids Hack Day, what is Kids Hack Day? Uh, we are a non-profit organization, and what we do is that we give the possibility to kids to explore tech and programming. And we started with like a lot of events all over the world. Last summer we had two summer camps, and then we saw that it was very popular in Stockholm, so we started a tech club. And we went there? Yeah. Can we see what it looked like when we came visit uh, Kids Hack Day? with uh, software engineering. I'm not really for software. I'm more like to build and then program. I'm gonna become a programmer. I'm building a little yeah, theft alarm with uh, Victor here. I hope I can be an engineer. So that's why I'm doing these things. The coding, yeah, it's fun to, when you understand it. And it's also fun to see your creations uh, in work. I want to do things with my hands, not only <laughs> with the keyboard. My name is uh, Filippa and I like to programming. Create with my hands, with the body, <laughs> whole body, not just the fingers. Whole body. I have created a computer game where you are this little butterfly. And you have honey, ammo and points to get honey. The tech industry, here we are! <laughs> <But> what, <laughs> what was amazing there, it was, I think that's hopefully what the world will look like someday. There were people from all different countries, there were yeah. no difference between <laughs> boys and girls at the level. Would, would you agree? Is it? Yeah, I think it's super. I mean, already we have a team which is super with volunteers from like Brazil, Russia, Iceland, Iran, Sweden. And we start to get more girls coming to the club as well. 
And, and are girls, as, and girls and boys as curious? Is there any difference? Yes, because we have noticed that if we go to a school and do like a tech day or something, the girls are equally interested. So I think it's more the parents who like, if you have a girl, you might send her to dance and they focus on these kind of girly activities, but they don't tell them that, oh, why don't you go to tech club and learn to program or build your own robots or something? So, Paulina, uh, if the other panel were sort of on the barricades, you were part of building the barricades. You've been very advocate in this question, but you also have a very long time uh, in technology yourself. Could you sort of first tell us a little bit of what you do now? Uh, well, I'm sort of, um, I've been working in different startups uh, up until now, but about a year ago I started my own company. Um, I was thinking about what Ulrika said of not actually considering myself being an entrepreneur, but I guess in a way I am. Um, and Besides that, I've been, like, for many, many years, basically on my spare time working on different initiatives to encourage women, girls to get into tech and mm -hmm. sort of um, encouraging female role models to, to be seen more and sort of, yeah, just lots of stuff. And Geek Girls Meetup is one thing. Could you, what is that? Geek Girl Meetup was uh, founded by a couple of friends of mine, um, uh, Heidi and uh, Andy, about six years ago, I think. Um, it's a non-profit organization. It's, um, uh, it, we actually have, have um, three different parts now. So we have one Geek Girl Mini, which is run by Karin Nygård, which focuses on, on younger kids, um, but it's, it's only girls. And then we have sort of the, the main part, the one has, that has existed the longest, which is targets uh, women which is Geek Girl Meetup, and then we have Geek Girl Plus now. Geek for, Girl Plus. Yes, exactly. For women, I think, above 40, 40 uh -huh. plus. So it, it's growing, and it's, it's all sort of run by women on their spare time, uh, women who, who are really passionate about this and, and want to make a change. And, and, can, and, and can the audience here join if they're interested? Sorry? Can the audience here join if they're interested? Yeah, absolutely, but only if you're a woman. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and, and if you, if you sort of by, by a strike of a magic wand would be uh, the dictator of Sweden, a very nice dictator, <laughs> yeah. but, but, but still, with, with the power to change anything you want to change, yeah. which were the first three things you would change? Well, so the first thing is sort of ironic because I just told you that Geek Girl Mita is all about sort of, it's uh, for women only. But mm. what I would say is I really wanted to be 100% natural for women and men to be friends. And the reason why I think that um, is because, w we've been talking about it earlier today, about sort of funding companies, and it, it's, you know, it, it's, you might think it's something very formal, something that you do, I don't know, in offices or, you know, in a professional role, but it actually happens at parties, um, in, in the sauna, wherever, when you're on a trip with a friend. Um, my husband and I almost founded a company, and we came up with the idea at a boring party, and we just Googled the, the domain that we wanted and, and ran back home. We just left the party and everything and just um, bought the domain, and, and the company was sort of up and running. So it, it it's sort of, the reason why I want women and men to be friends is because sort of you never know when it happens. You never mm -hmm. know when somebody has a great idea. And I want it to be equally possible that the person that you sort of turn to, like, mm -hmm. hey, do you want to start a company as a woman? Um, it could, could as well be as a woman as a man. Uh, so that's sort of the first thing. Um, and I would also... What was the original question? <laughs> <laughs> You're saying what, so many interesting things. I'm forgetting my question. Yet. No, the, the three things you would like to change. Men and women, you make a yeah. law, men and women needs to be friends. Yeah. Second thing and as also, a dictator. I also, I would love for sort of, I want all startups to have at least one female co-founder. And I'm also thinking about this, this things that Ulrika was talking about, sort of, I want more female stakeholders and owners. I've been consulting for, for startups, actually plenty of startups, and a friend of mine asked me, like, so do you get shares in these, these startups? And I was like, no, I haven't even asked. And, and he was like, why not? Like, imagine if you actually invested, invest your time in lots of startups and you have like even the slightest share in all of these, you know, at least one of them will probably grow huge and then, 
your home. <laughs> but, how, but if I go deeper into that question, let's say you pass a law, there should be one women founder. But if there isn't a woman in the founding team, how do you get them in? If there are fewer women trying to start a company, how, how do you solve that riddle? You, you just have to mingle with women and sort of understand that there's this huge pool of really smart, capable, uh, sort of passionate women and and it's also good to actually I actually founded a, a Facebook group called the job tips for kvinnor in om tech or startups gaming uh, you Kottos can check it now very uh, short uh, I know I know <laughs> and in Swedish which is stupid but you should all check it out because um, not only is it a great platform for um, women and companies to meet but I think it's super important for women to actually know that the companies care about these questions mm. that it's that they actually want to make a difference so actually talking about it like Mentimeter is a startup, um, the founder, one of the founders, Johnny, uh, is great at, at talking about sort of caring about these questions. And now mm -hmm. he has plenty of women in the company and amazing mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one thing you can do. Sofia, uh, Shalmash, uh, at an engineering school, academic institution, uh, and you invest in companies, you do all kinds of things within Shalmash. Could you tell me what is Startup Birds? Well, Startup Birds is an initiative that grew within the business incubator, Shalmut Innovation, where a few female founders were actually just talking over lunch about, wouldn't it be more fun if there were more girls here? And of course, uh, we as an incubator want to support this, so we started Startup Birds just to be out more and represent the incubator in various events to show, well, the world that there are female founders and to inspire. And, and when you see teams coming to you, is there any difference between women and men team or mixed teams or, or from an investor's perspective, how do you look upon the different teams? Um, I guess from my personal experience, I would say that being in tech, women do tend to perform a little bit better, be a bit more goal oriented and prepared before they come, while as men might just pick an idea from last night and come and present it just as that. <laughs> so but, but that, there's that, good that, and that's bad quite, in that, quite but interesting. <laughs> Women are mere prepared and know what the hell they're talking about. Men shoot from the hip. What do you like the most as an investor? I mean, there are two, there are two traits, good and bad, right? Of course, we love both because passion being the most important thing for an entrepreneur. Uh, but you do have different roles as an entrepreneur within a team. You have to be both prepared and very, very passionate about what you do. And you have to be prepared to dare to choose an idea that you had just last night. So we need but, but, both. But uh, do you think mixed teams build better value from an investor's perspective? Well, diversity always build better value. I mean. Uh, as a team, you need diversity in gender, in age, in ethnicity. It provides value to both the team and the industry as a whole. So we, we, uh, we went out and asked 15-year-old uh, girls in schools for SIME, um, would you like to be an engineer? How many says they want to be an engineer, do you think? 5%. Between 1% and 5% per class. Yeah. And then we change the word, but we describe the creation yeah. that an engineer can do, and then it's almost vice versa. So is, is there sort of a need to just find other words for some of these things? Because they're very sort of male words that, that rings a bell in a certain way. Uh, but sort of the, the, the creativity, and then what would you see in, the, uh, you know, in mm. your lab, it's completely different than, than, than what people would think an engineer is doing. Well, I mean, I think we need to show kids and especially girls that like engineering can be really fun. So I think that like a mentor program would be super just to bring these kids to see maybe Google or Spotify or whatsoever to see what you really work with. Because I think that many times if you say engineer, they think about, oh, I might work in a factory with something really boring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think? No, I totally agree. Um, it's not about just about the wording, but I, I know that at KTH, the school that I attended, they changed the name for their Vegovatten uh, program <laughs> uh, to, um, I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but sort of some health design or some health something, uh, and it made a huge difference. Oh, really? So it is about the wording as well, mm. but uh, definitely about sort of changing the image of what engineering is. Um, 
it is a domain that has been sort of shaped and formed by men for a long time, and not just men, but a specific type of man, I would say. Uh, so you're expected to be sort of nerdy, really sort of introvert. Uh, those are the sort of characters that are being highlighted, and I think that's, that's completely wrong. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm actually working now on a, a, a huge, I can't say too much about it, but it's a huge tech festival together with KTH and a number of uh, huge tech companies that I can't mention right now, but I will in, in due time. Um, that's what's called a cliffhanger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is, is tar uh, targets girls aged 11 to 18. Um, and, and the whole focus of that tech festival, and we call it festival because of that, is to sort of change the image of what tech can be used for and programming can be used for and sort of combine it with music and art and all sorts of things. But, but, but it's funny because nerd used to be something bad. But now this, this is like being a punk rocker or whatever. You can decide mm. to be a nerd and then that's super cool as well. Mm. So I mean, there, there's, uh, there's a changing perception also about people that, that, that like doing other things than football and rap. Um, but, but going back to Chalmers, what do you do as, as a technology institution to get more women interested in tech? Apart from startup girls, I mean, uh, or startup birds, mm -hmm. uh, what, what do you do sort of in, on, on the school or the school's image? Um, well, actually, uh, at the moment, Chalmers is making a huge effort towards entrepreneurism in general, mm -hmm. uh, consolidating the two incubators within Chalmers and putting 500 million uh, Kronor into uh, investments and also 100, uh, no, 500 million in total for investments and um, uh, and for running the incubators for a 10 year period uh, and also having an actual goal to give uh, a majority of the students uh, uh, an experience in being an entrepreneur. So that is an amazing. Uh, and will you invest in companies that are not coming from Chalmers? Could anybody here contact you as well? We are open to anyone at Chalmers Innovation. Anyone can come with their idea and the team. Um, I mean, we're situated in Gothenburg, but you can be from Stockholm. It's all right. You're allowed. <laughs> uh, so so we'll, we're happy to listen to anyone. And uh, of course, uh, I'd love to see more women uh, bringing their ideas. How do you mm -hmm. think very rapidly that sort of parents, teachers, and other people that, <laughs> that, that touch a young person's life could be sort of better at, at, at equality and at, at sort of sowing the seeds that creates entrepreneurship? I think it's about rewards, really. I mean, the brain is so simple. I, if, you're, if you're encouraged and you're rewarded for your uh, trying to do something entrepreneurial, then of course they will do it again and try more and try mm. harder. Mm. So, I mean, if you start with rewards early, then of course... Good old you, capitalism. You yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it works great on kids. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's all about sort of changing kids, understanding that you have the possibility to change a person, a kid's image of themselves and, mm -hmm. and uh, their possibility to be, become an engineer or programmer. Mm -hmm. Karin Nygård, um, who is an advocate for these things, and she's a teacher and running Geek Girl Nini, she told me that she, she is programming with both girls and boys, and uh, she evaluates them. And uh, in one class, it was sort of very obvious that the, the guys, the boys, overestimated their um, <laughs> programming <laughs> skills, whereas the girls underestimated the programming skills. And actually, the best student was a girl, and she told that girl, like, do you know that you were actually, you were the person in this class who was best at solving this problem? And she was like, mind blown. Um, and, and I think that's sort of a story that I really think about really often. Make sure that you, you understand that you have that role in, in changing the way girls look at themselves and boys. We started with the kids, and I want to end with the kids as well. <laughs> what, what is your advice to parents and teachers and others? Well, I think really that we should get tech and programming to be like a part of the normal school education, because that would also make it to become something normal that everybody does and not like something gender connected. I mm. think that, that mm. that's, uh, that's where it needs <coughs> to start. And mm. I think that uh, you're all doing very, go very good work. So uh, inspiring to hear you and hope to mm. continue the conversation. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>
I just thought when I heard the, the, this panel, but uh, yesterday my son came home from school and he said, wow, mama, I only had two lessons yesterday, you know? And I said, oh, you did? Only two? And he said, yeah, because I was elected to go to the six-year-olds and, and help Emma teach them to program. <laughs> so he had the possibility to actually be a, a teacher or a co-teacher, helping the, the, the wee ones to get in uh, the program le lesson. That's and good. It, and it's I and was really proud. And the, the teaching aspect is fun because at uh, Kids Hack Day, nobody gets paid to be there. There are people ranging from astronauts to programmers to others that just want to be there in that environment. And that's also an open, innovation, uh, open invitation. Uh, if anybody of you want to come there and share your knowledge, please do so a day or two uh, and just connect with, with the guys at Kids Hack Day. Mm, really? We're moving that's onwards. Good. We're moving on because yeah. this is true. And I'm that moving you on as well. Ah, uh, please, please. <laughs> applause and applause. <laughs> Thank ah, you. Applause for nice. You know, it's, it's the truth that it's important to start early, but it's also a truth that real change can never happen without a CEO that wants that change. And 2011, Hillary Clinton decided to gather some wise and creative women through over the world to solve some gender equality problems that she needed she said, this, we must get a solution of this. So she formed a global council of 20 women from business and society and had them to get, the, get together and create AVDs. Maud Olofsson, at that time, the Swedish Minister of Enterprise, she was elected chairman of the Council of uh, Getting Women in Leadership and Entrepreneurship. Everyone knows that behind every hard-working, brilliant woman, there is another hard-working, brilliant woman. And now we will meet, yes, the woman who had the inspiring task to, from all these discussions, form Hillary Clinton's pledge of how women can encourage and empower each other to start companies and take leadership. Please welcome Anna Litagen, founder of Talent Tribe, on stage to present the golden rules of leadership. Hey, Anna, and Ulrika, thank you so much for that generous introduction. Um, generosity is something that I'm going to be speaking about and I'm very excited actually because we're touching upon all the subjects that I am so passionate about and I can actually call myself an entrepreneur now. I've been an entrepreneur for quite some time and I don't think you shouldn't, you should never underestimate the power of entrepreneurs within your organizations. So and Ola, as he opened here, uh, earlier today talked about the importance of visions of being bold and courageous and of having and of dreaming and of being curious and that's also very important and to be able to do that and to be able to encourage your entrepreneurs you also need to be a great leader and pick others up and ideas and to work together on those issues so the golden rules of leadership, how women promote each other. And actually, it's not just about women. It's about promoting really great people and of bringing each other along and of pulling as you climb. So I'm actually very proud to be able to call myself uh, an entrepreneur because I kind of threw myself out there, like most of you uh, probably also have, but from more of a, not from a, business uh, business position but rather from a government position and of working in government agencies but i've had the opportunity of being creative uh, all along and now i'm the founder and ceo of talent tribe a creative diversity agency several of you have also mentioned the importance of regardless of age regardless of gender and regardless of where ethnicity or wherever you come from the the importance of being creative and of having a diverse uh, group of creative people. So I work in global leadership and social entrepreneurship. And like Rosie said before, uh, and Ola also touched upon, it's uh, going to be increasingly important to be 
uh, working on social issues and of making the world a better place in entrepreneurship. So what I try to do is to connect and curate the next generation of entrepreneurs and leaders. And as you're all, or most of you at least, uh, or want to be, or you're already or currently in tech, you need to get the best minds and talent together, and you need to get idea power, and you need to get uh, talent to work on corporate innovation, of being innovative. And as we all know, that's not always the case. You don't always get the best or best ideas to work on the challenges because the best ideas or the best minds might not get that opportunity. One of my role models is uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton. She has said, talent is universal, opportunities are not. And as you all, all know, this is where we need to create opportunities for each other in er any way we can. And tech is a great leverage, leverage to do that. We need to create opportunities for each other, include each other in decision-making positions, in business. And we need to, uh, I think it was uh, Charlotte earlier, she mentioned the importance of me uh, mentoring each other. And this is something I get to develop and to continue to push an advocate for. And through creating big and bold visions and being a doer. And that's what I would like to encourage all of you to do also. Uh, I was working, as Ulrika said, together with the Maul Olofsson. And she was nominated to, uh, to actually be the, the head for the leadership subcommittee in the International Council on Women's Business Leadership. And the four committees, and here you see a few of the powerhouses behind the subcommittees, but it was access to capital, access to markets, capacity building and skills training, and leadership. And the others, they were backed by uh, the World Bank globally, Ernst & Young globally, Pfizer globally, and then there was Modenai in leadership. So we decided, of course, we were the smallest team. We needed to get a really, really good group of people together to team up with some really prominent and uh, hardworking women and to have the most impact of all the groups. Uh, and uh, we also, a few of you have mentioned earlier that you're, you love competition and you love uh, challenges. And that's what we also did and what we still do and what we set out to do together. So here you see, for example, a few of the women involved. Sherry Blair of the Sherry Blair Foundation. Uh, and uh, Indra Noy of Pepsi, for example. Mira Sanyal, who's from India. We made sure to get a really diverse group together. We also uh, got to collaborate with Beth Brook of Ernst & Young. And uh, Sheikha Lubna from the uh, United Arab Emirates. And uh, actually, th this was from, uh, from a session in October of last year. And there will be several meetings coming up this year and uh, ahead. And we'll, we'll drive the process forward together. So we decided, since we were, this was a small group, we decided to, uh, to be creative and to uh, get as much leverage as possible from all the talented women and the talented uh, people that were on the small team. We didn't have much resources, but we thought, why, why invent everything again? Why do that? Do uh, have this process of uh, of coming up with new inventions, of new things to implement? Uh, instead, we decided to interview everyone involved and to to uh, ask them and ask for best practices. And how did you, uh, in your opinion, and uh, rise to the position where you're at right now? So. Everyone, regardless of age or regardless of where they're from, said the things that have mattered the most to me and that have made, it, uh, made me uh, to the position where I am today and to rise to that level said it's because of role models, like we were talking about before, the importance of role models. It's about access to networks, about building networks, about leadership training and about men mentorship and sponsorship. So this is what everyone said was very, very important. And Charlotte mentioned this before, 
and um, several of you have, have uh, mentioned the importance of all these components. So what can all of us do to help each other rise to, to the levels of leadership and to help others and bring each other along? We decided to work on all these components and to implement a leadership program that we called Women Up. Uh, we did this together with, you can see, uh, Joanna Barsh is in the right-hand corner uh, of McKinsey. So together with McKinsey and uh, collaborating with public-private partnerships, entrepreneurs, big global companies, ministers and uh, big corporations, we decided to look at what can all of us do everywhere at all levels and globally. So that's what we did. And we, uh, when we interviewed, we decided to boil it down to, uh, to s several uh, concrete advice of what can each and every one of us do. And saw that it's really easy for us and all of us to share our networks with rising women leaders. We can actively promote each other and promote women as role models. So wherever you are and whatever you do, you can mention each other, you can mention talented women, you can mention each other when you speak publicly. So that's what we decided, and we decided on the golden rules of leadership and creating opportunities for each other globally. And number three, endorse and make women leaders more visible. And this is what Equalisters, Rättvisa Förmedlingen, what they also do. Uh, we took what they do as a, also a good example of how it can be done. And for example, earlier here today, and this is, a, this is a great example of how this works and how it should work, uh, Linda Krondal, she's also part of Women Up. And she actually, right here before, she said, oh, if you want to move your uh, part of your business and to have an event at our, the hub she just uh, talked about, feel free to do some. You, you would be more than welcome. And this is exactly how it works. Also, uh, each time that I go to an event like this, I always ask for an extra invitation and I always mentor uh, talent and women that I see potential in. So today, and I hope she's still here, I've invited Faduma Adan. Faduma, are you still here? She, I think she's up there somewhere. Uh, Faduma is here. And uh, I always make sure to ask for one extra invitation to bring someone along and to create opportunities for someone who wouldn't otherwise have been invited. And it's really easy to do, and I think I, I encourage all of you to start doing that. And of course, this, they would need an even, I think you talked about maybe hosting this at Circus or even bigger event next year. And I think you, if everyone asked for an extra invitation for someone else, that's something you definitely need to do. But you can do this in many, many occasions, when you're invited to seminars, when you're invited to speeches, when you're invited in boardrooms, in decision-making roles, invite someone along that you believe in to, for that person to get that extra knowledge and contacts and experience. So that's the golden rules of leadership. It's a generous approach to invite more talented women, more talented people into the circle uh, and widen the circle include more people. And that way we create a ripple effect, a positive movement that can help others that wouldn't otherwise have been invited. So I encourage you to do that. And that's actually the core of the golden rules of leadership. And we talked about difference making here earlier. We talked about making a difference, being change makers and being entrepreneurs in a respective organization. So think about what would you like for yourself? What would you like for each other? And create that. And be a, ro a leader and a role model in any field and in your respective fields. And make sure that others can follow. So think about what would you like to create for yourself? What would you like others to include you into? Ask for it, but also uh, be sure that you offer things to people that you believe in and even when they haven't asked for it. Make introductions, make referrals, recommendations, and also I encourage you to share each other's success and each other's stories. And share each other's, when you see someone in an article, share that article instead of someone else 
having to share it themselves. And I know that most of you here are familiar with the uh, Jante Lagen. Uh, maybe most people wouldn't share that article themselves, but lift each other up, share those articles, push each other in social media, and make sure to encourage and empower each other. And here is, uh, it's about making a difference, about including and endorsing and achieving greater diversity in general. So for all of us to have uh, more future leaders and entrepreneurs. And actually, I, I, um, in the PowerPoint presentation I sent, and I know you're all techies, my, uh, my uh, email address was included, but now it's not. So I was going to ask you or encourage you to share your stories with me and you could send them in by, by email, but since they're not there, and um, since it's not there, I, I will be uh, not so techy and uh, I know it's a coffee break and I hope I'm not uh, saying too much. I'm longing for coffee now. But I will, after the coffee break, I will be sending this around. And someone had also uh, mentioned uh, the importance of having fun and of playing. Uh, so make sure to shine and sparkle in every way you can. And there's a small message in here for all of you who look inside. So please uh, feel free to put your business card in here. I will be circulating it after the break. Thank you so much, and uh, please, the Golden Rules of Leadership. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you. Actually, I was thinking, I was thinking that is what we do here today. By organizing this event, these companies Google, Spotify, MTGX, Tele2, Bonnier, Shipstead, and Telia Sonera are practicing the golden rules right now and putting the spotlight on so many role models here today. We uh, are soon going to go on a break uh, within seconds, but the ones of you that want to connect, the password is music for life. Music for life. So music and then the four and life. But before we're going to go uh, on a break, I want you to turn around to the person next to you, but the other person this time, not your friend from the last break, your new friend. And you're just going to tell that person how you are going to implement the golden rules and what you're going to do better and more of while you go and have coffee. Now we have coffee. And we still have these organizations, these companies here to ask all the questions to, and they will answer in whatever you want to know. Okay, see you here, 10 past four, where we have Isa from Melody Festival and performing for us. 10 past four. Practicing the golden, ru golden rules was something we would su were supposed to do in the break. And so did I. Uh, and I met somebody that I would like to promote. Other mic, that works. <laughs> Came in handy. So, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce my new found friend, Gita. She comes from a really cool organization in Helsinki, and she's really interested in what we're doing here. Gita, tell us what you do. Hello. <laughs> the, the mic is off? I don't know. Hello. Now? Now. Yay! The human factor. Okay, let's try it again. <laughs> so, I'm Gita from Slush. Slush is a huge startup and tech conference in Helsinki. Uh, and, um, and this year it's going to be the 11th and 12th of November, and you're all really warmly welcome. Last year we had 14,000 visitors, but way too few women. So please come and let's make it a 50 50 event this year. And how. And how do you get a hold of you? How do you get invited? Uh, please come and talk to me in the hallway, uh, or then you can just go to www.slush.org. You're all warmly welcome. Let's, oh, I'm hoping that I meet all of you in Helsinki, and you can talk, come and talk to me afterwards. Okay, Thank you. Gita from Slush. The next guest that I'm going to have a, in, my, in my interview share, she's one of the leading venture capitalists with one of the leading venture capitalist venture capital firms, not only in Stockholm, Sweden, 
but in Europe and maybe the world. They invest in companies like Spotify and others, and they have the Midas touch. So I'm very curious to hear what's hot right now and how to get some of all that money. Marta from North Zone, please. <laughs> I don't, does it, oh. So, very welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I know you just flew in from Barcelona and the world's largest mobile and technology fair there. Uh, are you okay? Yes, I, I sound a little, a little bit like Al Capone after a night out, but uh, I hope you can <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> of course I'll forgive you. I always forgive you. If you tell me what's the next cool thing in technology, what are the things we're going to go, ah, about a year from now? Wow, yeah, this is a good time to ask me. I've just come back from the Mobile World Congress, and it was all about IoT, it was all about virtual reality. IoT, Internet of Things. Internet of Things, um, sensors in just about everything. It was about um, a, a lot about virtual reality and the new platforms. Yeah, what, what's up with that? What can you do with virtual reality nowadays? I mean, what can't you do with virtual reality, right? It's, it's all about you know being able to live and, and um, uh, experience whatever you might not be able to do in the ordinary world. It's about extending opportunities. It's about better user experience above and beyond everything else. So it will really change computing in a, in a fundamental way. I, I even heard that the new low-cost travel, I mean, forget Ryanair, you put on your glasses and then you just go anywhere and you experience a day. And that's something you can do in China and India for like a dollar if you can't afford to fly. So there's a whole industry being created. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, travel is one, education is another, mm. uh, and not to mention entertainment. We invest in entertainment uh, as well, so this is a, a big focus point for us. For me, it's super. I'd love to go kickboxing fights without getting punched. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was part of the like fun. <laughs> no, it's punching the other guy. I'll explain that <laughs> later. But but uh, what what can what kind of companies can get investments from you? Because a lot of people think that uh, oh the venture capitalists are so evil they didn't invest in my company. But you see maybe 400 companies a year or j just you. So so and, and you invest maybe in one or two or three. Yeah. So yeah, the proportions are actually quite. <laughs> extreme. So I'd say we see about like uh, six to nine hundred companies a year uh, and we're, we're present in Stockholm, Oslo, Copenhagen, New York and London uh, and these are the companies that we meet. We get probably triple that in terms of requ funding requests and we probably invest in about ten companies a year. Last year was an exception. This was our bus busiest year ever. We did 22 investments. Mm. All, all in all these markets put together? Yes. So, so understanding that about venture capitalists, it's kind of, it's as easy to becoming a pop star as it is to get venture capital. It's probably easier to become a pop star, right? No, but that's the statistics you have against you. But of course, Isa couldn't care less. She knows she's going to be a pop star, and so do you when you come to Martin Percent. But those are the statistics. So um, what would you, um, if, if, if you uh, look at the women coming to you, mm -hmm. there, I would imagine there are a lot fewer than men. What, what are they sort of what are they introducing? What kind of what kind of entrepreneurship is different or interesting or because you, you invest and look at a lot more uh, women entrepreneurs than you used to do in the VC industry as well? Well, actually, that's that's a very good point is that I don't I really don't see enough women, frankly. I mean, uh, out of the uh, well, six to nine hundred companies that we see uh, annually, I can probably count my number of meetings with women on like maybe two hands mm. at best. And that's not because I reject or, um, or uh, grant meetings to <laughs> entrepreneurs based on their gender. It's that I simply don't get enough requests. Mm. Uh, and you know, with the type of companies that we look for are very ambitious. They're global from day one. Mm. Born Global is something we talk about mm. here in Stockholm all the time. We look for everything from seed stage companies to growth stage companies. And, you know, actually, I'm really happy to, to announce that we just made our uh, first investment from our new fund, North Zone 7, into an all-female founder team. Oh, uh -huh, cool. And, uh, e What's the company? It's called Outfittery. Uh, it's, it's, it's an awesome company. <laughs> <laughs> but let me just say this. We, we really invest in rock star teams. That's what I, what I cannot uh, really... 
uh, underline enough and whether they're male, female, different ethnicities, ages. For us, it's about seeing the most excellent entrepreneurs out there. And the more entrepreneurs we see, now that brings that diversity in, the, m the better the quality. What do you look for in an entrepreneur? What are the typical traits? Well, megalomania. Megalomania. <laughs> you want to take over the <laughs> I'm world, <kidding>. okay? <laughs> so no. they're insane. Okay, that's good. What more? Oh, uh, we look. We, I mean, on the series, now we look for product-focused entrepreneurs, uh, people who are building products and companies around products. That's that's really important to us. Mm. People who are so ambitious. they start with building a great product, and yeah. then that becomes a company. They're yeah. not some finance guy that has a business plan and then wants to build a product. Exactly. Okay. They're they're not some finance guys generally that tend to want to, you know. Um, uh, employ a couple of developers to build the product and then he or she will like um, commercialize it. We try to go for the product people out there who have a vision of changing the world through their product. So, so um, why do you think there are fewer tech entrepreneurs than men? I've been thinking about this question a lot and you can take it from two different kind of perspectives. There is the, the like functional perspective which is that not many women learn to code early enough, hence to become a product person becomes a little bit more difficult. And then to become an entrepreneur as a product person becomes excruci excruciatingly more difficult. Mm -hmm. That's the one mindset. But the other mindset is the whole psychological element, the go for it, the over preparation and under kind of like just going out and, and testing things. Mm -hmm. We really believe in fail fast, fail often, and then you'll succeed. And I feel as though that's, that's the core reason that I see. And what's it like to work in an industry where, where sort of, how many, how many male partners and how many female partners or investment managers? So we, we're a total of 10 investment, ma investment professionals. Mm -hmm. uh, Jessica and me, both Stockholm based, are the only uh, investing managers. Mm -hmm. And we have Stine in Oslo, who is, uh, well, she works with us more on supporting our portfolio mm -hmm. from a CFO perspective. So that's three, that's actually, that's actually way above the, st the industry average. It has frankly. to be a woman in a very sort of male dominated industry. I mean, how, how it, it, could you sort of share some, is it, is it very sort of manly men running around doing these investments or, or <laughs> could you just describe? Well, you know what? I've never really seen myself as a woman in technology. I've always really focused on being a professional in technology and sticking to results, being mm. results oriented. And from that perspective, I, I can't really claim that I've been discriminated against. Um, however, there is, I can name a ton of instances where <laughs> it could have been very uncomfortable to be a female in technology, but you just have to ignore those and like be professional and, and be uh, goal oriented. And I think, you know, well, the first time we met, maybe like seven years ago at SEMA, was the perfect experience of, I think it was actually my first ever VC work trip. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, this is awesome. This is, you know, there's no cues in the toilet for once. That was like a good starting <laughs> point. <laughs> but then I realized that's not very good, is it? <laughs> and I've seen the positive development over the past, like whatever, I've, I've been in the industry maybe for like six, seven years. I've seen a very positive development, but I think there's a lot more that can be done. And it's all about going for it, as opposed to thinking, should I think about this? Should I not? Should, you know, wh how, how is the world gonna treat me if I'm a woman? Mm -hmm. Be professional, be, you know? You're also starting a hashtag, awesome men. <laughs> <laughs> or is that a secret? Well, I mean, it's not, it's, it's a bit of a commercial, it's not a, it's not a secret to my friends, but I, uh, I really believe in um, there being awesome people that support each other, and I wouldn't be standing here if I didn't have awesome men in my life as well, I have uh, an awesome husband and two little boys, uh, and we support each other a lot, and I think it goes back to Cheryl Sandberg's Lean In principle, um, where you need to really kind of develop a culture of there, it being okay to be a parent or a partner or whatever it is that you're not whenever you're not a, an entrepreneur or an investor. And I think that has a lot to do with it. So Awesome Men is, uh, I'm, I'm kind of an active Instagrammer and Awesome Men is my hashtag for capturing all these moments when I see guys do awesome things. If it's like, it can be anything. It can be like walking around with a stroller in, in downtown Manhattan, which is far less common than in Stockholm, mm -hmm. frankly. Uh, or it can be, 
you know, just about anything. And I'd like to invite more people to use that hashtag and to, to point out how great it can be to have supportive men when it comes to traditionally female mm. roles. So, so um, another question, is it more or less difficult for women and uh, for a woman or a man to get venture capital? What would you think? You know what? I think statistics run in a way that it's a funnel, right? Uh, of the, say, a thousand companies that an investor meets annually, they might invest in five mm. or something. Is it more difficult to wo for women to get the venture capital? I'm not sure because I don't see enough in the funnel. Mm. Is it more difficult for women to get attention for going out and meeting investors? No, I'd say it's much easier. Mm -hmm. Frankly, investors out there, partially because of the discussions that are ongoing, are looking for female entrepreneurs and not just for them being female. I can't invest in an entrepreneur because she's female. I no. yeah, it doesn't work. But for awesome entrepreneurs that are data-driven, product-focused, and really ambitious. Mm -hmm. Those are the three key things. And I'd like to add one more thing. I actually don't think that there is space for gender in technology, in the technology world. That is moving so fast that you should just go for it, as I said before, and just forget about everything else. I, th I think that's a key message. Uh, what's your advice for somebody that wants to create a company that get venture funding and go on and change the world? So you have 30 seconds to give brilliant advice. Time starts uh, now. Time pressure. Oh, okay. Well, I think that it's really important to go out there and get a support circle around yourself. Get people who will vouch for you. We invest in people, in entrepreneurs, a lot through our network. Mm -hmm. and we have, uh, you know, our successful entrepreneurs um, spreading the word about, you know, us as investors and thereby also introducing us to other potential entrepreneurs. That's one way. So get people to vouch for you. That's only secondary, however, to building a product and an awesome team. We invest in epic teams. Star, uh, I think we've, we've mentioned the, the term rock star teams a number of times, and that's what we do. So get a great team, focus on product, and get people to vouch for you are the top three tips I have. And just go for it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marta from North Zone. Um, Rika. Yes. Talent, yes. talent, talent. Talent. Yeah. We hear she's talking about talent. Everybody's talking about talent. And that's really interesting, I think, because just soon we are going to have a top, top, top executive panel here. But I spotted among you Katarina Berg, who is a global HR person at Spotify. And she is a one, a person that I really want to talk talent to. So are you here, Katarina? Are you still here? Please, By applause. The Lord, the golden we bring her up invited. to give her tips. Ah. How do you Who coach and grow road? talent? <laughs> and how do you staff a talented orientation and passion-dependent tech organization? Yeah, that's how, how the hell do you do that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's thank, interesting thank you for this hijacking. I talked myself out of panel two weeks ago, and now here I am at stage. Thank yeah. you, Rika. <laughs> really appreciate that. I imagine you're always looking for talent. Have you it, spotted any here today? Yeah, it's an all star team here, so uh, not so hard. Now, what we actually do have, and it's not up to me, it's uh, I do have a team, or we do have a team at Spotify, a talent acquisition team that are 18 people that scout for talent and work with talent intelligence 24-7, mm -hmm. 365. Oh, and some impressive. of them are here. You so know, if you get poached, uh, please uh, be open to uh, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what are you looking in recruiting management? Mm -hmm. What experience, what skills? Mm. We do have a manager SLA, uh, which is a service level agreement, which is built on five leadership criteria. Um, and I will not say what they are, because they are our secret sauce, of course. Uh, and then we recruit, we train or we dress all our managers on, on those criteria. And then we evaluate them, yes, we do. And then we sometimes deploy on them. Too. Mm -hmm. But you won't tell us what, what to be if you want to be a Spotify person. No, we will uh, see if you have that, and then uh, that will be... Spilling the secret sauce would be really stupid, because um, all the other sponsors are looking maybe for the same thing. 
uh, and also I think uh, we Probably. all know what really good leadership is and we all practice it sometimes and sometimes we don't and then we also know what really bad leadership is mm. so it's not really unique but it's I think what's special maybe is that everybody in in the company or in the organization was invited to be part of deciding what those leadership criteria are. So not just managers or the lead team or HR or the learning and development team, but all uh, employees as well. But if you would, um, if, uh, if you would coach me, for example, right. to be a top executive in the media tech business, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, what, what do one need to learn? What would you say to everybody here? What do we need to learn to make a career in the tech business? But here, I don't, I don't think we are different. I don't think uh, Spotify or the, the rest of the companies actually differ that much. Good leadership is good leadership wherever you see it. Uh, it has, for us, a lot to do with motivation and communication skills. Uh, especially, uh, I, don't, I think you think we are younger than we are, and not necessarily now when you see me, but uh, I think, the, comp uh, I think the, the average age is 34, 70%, close to 70% are engineers or um, tech people, or you know, if you include uh, product and design as well. So I don't think it's special you know, skill set or anything in leadership that is typical for us. I think that goes for all the types of industries I've been to. But motivation, I would say, uh, and the communication skills. And also being a Swedish semi-company or a global company, but with a lot of Swedish uh, values in, 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 the, in the platform. I think another thing is that clarity uh, and trying to be you know, a bit more suggesting, proving, and also a bit more assertive are the things that we train a lot. Mm. Thank you for sharing this. Thank you for inviting me. A bit me. of um, <laughs> business secrets here. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. And now, now we will meet three women that obviously is passionate about their work, or they would never be here. They would never have gotten so far in their careers. It is for me a great luxury and privilege to have here Ingrid Bunde, Chief Financial Officer and Deputy Chief Executive Officer at Vattenfall. She has been the advisor to the World Bank Group. She has been elected Näringslivets mäktiga Disciplina. Welcome, Thank please. And she handles a turnover over 166 million kroner in one of the largest electricity heating providers in Europe. Splendid. We also have here Helene Barnikov, Chief Commercial Officer at Telia Sonora. Commander of a company global sales and development of new services. As Internet of Things, for example, she is leading an organization of 600 employees and responsible for a turnover of around 8 billion kroner. Wow. And Annie Vigelius, entrepreneur, intrapreneur, and TV queen. My ladies. Today working as a senior advisor in strategy and business development and organizers of conferences like this for creative people thinking new and innovative thoughts. Very, very welcome. Do you want Thank me to you. sit over there? You can sit wherever you want, okay. but I'll sit here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you are three in three very different industries, but as the rest of the world, it has been fundamentally changed by the digital era. Uh, instead of talking about what happened, because most of us knows what happened, uh, I wanted to um, ask you about the future. What is ahead? What are you preparing for? Uh, where are your business going, Ingrid? Well, actually, in my industry now, the energy sector, the digitalization is coming very, very rapidly and very, very uh, fast, so, sort of hard. Um, we are an industry where you used to have these big power plants that you produced electricity, and then you as customers, you would once a year or so, you would sort of prolong your contract, and you would be happy if you had electricity coming into your apartment, and that was it. Tomorrow, uh, and what's happening rapidly right now, is the ability to store. It's the ability to actually have renewable energy, which means that you now have solar panels on your roofs, you have 
uh, earth power in your garden, you have a um, wind turbine in the community park, uh, you store through your uh, water pumps in your basement, and you have your app tomorrow where you will actually then actually control your energy consumption for the 24 hours, depending on when it's cheapest and when you want to do it. So I would say that it is one of the sectors that the digitalization is hitting very hard right now. And this sector does not look the same in five years' time that it does today. You don't even think we are going to be consumers of electricity? No, it's actually, we have this uh, statement now that it used to be us being producers, you being consumers. You will actually be producers in the, in the future because you will then, through your own production, through the solar panels and your wind turbines, you will generate sometimes actually excess capacity that you will import back to me because mm -hmm. you will have smart grids that will connect to us and it means that you probably will be more or less self-sufficient on energy and you will actually then be producers yourselves. So we keep on calling in the future, we will all be prosumers. Prosumers. Put that word on your minds. <laughs> uh, please, Helen. Antelia Sonera. I think that's a, that's a great opening because I think that's just an example that I think there is no such thing actually as digital life in the future. I think everything is digital actually because we don't say a digital camera any longer or a digital phone or something. It's of course a part of it is powered by digital. So we will do things offline and we will do things online and it, I think it will be seamless. So I think it will change actually everything we do. And when Ingrid talks about the um, everybody has an app, the app economy today is as big as the whole Hollywood movie industry. The app economy didn't exist 10 years ago and I think that's how quickly it actually goes. And if you look at my business then, which is coming from a telco, um, we look at this as, of course, it changes everything and it's a huge opportunity. It's also a huge responsibility for all of us in society because what we cannot do is to create another social divide. That people who understand how to do this can then do it and people who don't understand how to do it cannot be part of that economy because it changes everything. It's a new kind of life to live. So we look a lot on the, on the divide of, we talked before about the have and have nots, and now we talk about the can and cannots. So your challenge is to bring the people with you. We have to bring people with us so they can do their healthcare online when they want and not always have to go to the hospital, for example, that they can actually use what Ingrid just talked about mm. and be online and do that. And that we have to, that's, that's the bigger mega challenge and opportunity, of course. Mm. Annie, what do you say about the TV business? Ooh, your the industry? TV business mm -hmm. is going through seismic changes at the moment. Um, basically, what's been going on is literally, because my last job was the director of programs for SVT, Sveriges Television, mm -hmm. for about seven years. So basically, what has been going on is that I decided uh, what you liked, and then mm -hmm. I produced and financed the programs mm -hmm. and showed them when I wanted you to watch. Mm. basically, <laughs> and that has now changed. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> and we knew that, and we've been knowing that for a long time. The, and I would say, just as Ulrika Saxon said earlier, that right now it's not about the why or the what even, mm. but it's about the how, mm. because we have been working principally along the same sort of paradigm for the past 50 years, which means that we need new ways of organizing our businesses, both how we work, who has the power to decide what, what is the technology, mm. how are we going to make money, you know. And so wow. it's a huge task for these old co companies to just basically completely transform themselves. And there's a lot of challenges for you guys in all this because when these changes coming, you know, comes along, and you know, there's an, there's an extreme upheaval and a lot of people born, when I was born, I was lucky, I've sort of tagged along, <laughs> you know, and got it early, but there are a lot of us who did, doesn't get it at all, and that's mm. where you come in. So we're gonna be kicked out and you will be invited in, in the media industry. Mm. 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 A lot to think about, isn't it? But can I, can, I, can I actually a comment? Yeah, you said we're from such different companies, and now that you hear us talk, we're actually talking very much along the same lines because it is all powered by that digital transformation, mm. that digital shift. So what we talk about is actually quite similar in going forward. And what I think also is that you all talk about the citizens, 
the, the people mm -hmm. and change behavior from the people. And that is also interesting. In, in the, we talk about machines, the tech industry is about machines, but actually I think tech industry is more and more starting to be about people and human behavior. And human behavior is also an interesting aspect of leadership. And that's what I want to talk to you about also, career and leadership. Uh, Katrina earlier told us about uh, what you're looking for. Uh, what do you think that have made you so to be where you are today in your career, to succeed, uh, to reach the top? Well, I think you said earlier today that behind every successful woman there is another successful woman. Um, I think actually behind every successful woman there's a lot of work. Mm. Uh, I mean, I think we all have to... <laughs> applause. We all have to um, decide for ourselves what's important for us. Um, and we all are aware of the fact that there are sacrifices in doing that. I mean, or it's a compromise. It's not sacrifices, it's compromises. Because we're all human beings that make choices. Um, and I think that for me, it's always been fun to work. You know, it's, uh, I didn't have a passionate hobby. Uh, that some of my girlfriends had, but I actually enjoyed, I enjoyed the challenge of getting my wine to work, and I enjoyed the enormous challenge when I managed to get people to do the things I wanted them to do to together. Mm -hmm. When, you know, you got the team working and the creativity was flowing and you actually achieved something, that was for me fun. I mean, we have mm -hmm. different interests in that. And I think that what's important is for yourself to decide what you want, and, and to some extent what's important to you. Look yourself in the mirror, you know, does this match what I want to do? Mm -hmm and then go for it. And I was fortunate because I had some managers and bosses in my early career that actually gave me the confidence uh, to actually, and the liberty and, and responsibility to lot, do a lot of stuff. I'm still amazed today how they could do that. Mm -hmm. They sent me 23 years old to Japan to borrow billions on behalf of the Kingdom of Sweden alone. Mm. Yeah. But I did it, I managed, I succeeded, and that meant that I had the confidence <laughs> Thank you. And then, when I had opportunities or situations later in life where I failed, because we all fail from time mm -hmm. to time, mm -hmm. then I remembered, you know, yeah, but I could do it, I know that I can do it, so then I had the confidence to try again. And I think that is important, that you also end up in a situation that boosts you a bit and gives you the platform so that you have trust in yourself, mm -hmm. and then you can do miracles. Mm -hmm. But Every hardworking woman doesn't become uh, to your top positions. So what is it more than hard work and trust from the bosses? What do you say, Helen? I, yeah, no, I agree with many things. I think it really starts with finding what you're passionate about because you have to do it well. So that comes with hard work, but I think it, hard work is not enough. If you're not passionate about it, you mm. are not going to be that brilliant. And it's much and, more fun and to put I in the hard work if you, you have pick, a passion. Pick, pick something that you're going to love doing 24-7 and then you might do it much less, but pick what you really love doing. Mm. And then make sure you do it in an environment that gives you a ton of energy. Because if you are in energy draining environments, there is no way. And my third point would be make sure you have the right boss. And if you don't have the right boss, get yourself the right boss. Because if you have a boss that doesn't support you, doesn't believe in you, there, there is not going to be a bright future in that place. That would be my third thing. Take her for the, her words, you can choose. <laughs> and that's what the, why the company has always uh, tried to, to invite us to these places as well. What do you say, Annie? What have made you go so far as and choose your career in the way you did? Well, I agree about the work. Um, that's clear. Um, I think I've worked more than probably any other woman in my you know, uh, surrounding. Uh, I also had kids very late. I was almost 44. So it meant that, you know, I had a lot of time to work. But apart from that, <laughs> what did I do at work? I think I have been able to f find very early what I was good at and what I was bad at. And I think I've been very honest. I've been intellectually honest about that mm -hmm. because, you know, trust me, people will find you out. Uh, and when I had my first real you know, job as a boss. I sat alone at night in London trying to do budgets and, you know, I didn't know how to do Excel. And I was like, you know, devastated. And then at the end I realized that it was okay 
not to be good at structure and Excel. So I realized that I have to, you know, get the people close to me to do that. So I think I realized that I was good at generating uh, dedication, which basically means communicating purpose, which I think is the main motivator. Mm. Um, and also I think I have a high level of empathy, which helps because people want to be seen. You can't fake it because they're going to find you out if you are faking that you are interested in them and that you understand them on an emotional level. So I think I have uh, certain skills that, you know, I have been able to develop positively. Mm. But, it, but it, I'm not a school book example. I have not gone to business school. I've learned it the hard way. And, you know, but, but you please don't try and fake whatever, you, whatever it is that you really are not good at. Uh, and, you, you know, don't do the stuff that you're not good at because it takes so much energy. And I think when I hear you talking now that it might as well be very, very fun since you have to put so many hours yeah. in it. So why not have fun during, during the time? Can I add one more thing that I think is so important? Mm -hmm. And that is also, please. please, I mean, we all want to have relatively full lives. We all want to have friends and um, family and hobbies and whatever, culture. And we all have to recognize that you cannot work hard without having help with that. And please, all of you, buy help. recognize that we're not Amazons that can do everything. And I've actually always allocated a big chunk of my income on buying services. And it's been very, very helpful for me. And it's also actually enabled a lot of other people to make money, but it's also actually, it's been an absolute survivor. For me. Now I have a house husband. That's also to be recommended. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I also want to, to tell, tell us about some key moments uh, great challenges in your careers that were really crucial for success. Do you have any of those key moments in your life? Annie? Well, let's not talk about success. Let's talk about failure. Mm -hmm. Failure can yeah, be very I think important. You learn a, yeah, I think we should talk more about failure. Um, you learn a lot from them. And I think that's a key difference between Sweden for example, and the U.S., because in the U.S., if you, have, if you tell somebody who's recruiting you that you failed miserably in you, and, and like me, like spent 700 million Swedish kroner on something which turned out to be like at least 10 to 12 years too early to mm -hmm. hit the market, um, then they would say, oh, how interesting, you know, what was your learning? And in Sweden, they would go, ooh, you know, <laughs> ooh, True. she's a crazy woman, mm -hmm. you know, but I think... What I learned from that, because up until that moment... We're talking about K-World, isn't it? We're talking about K-World, mm -hmm. which had a humble little business proposal, which was basically built on marrying Stanford with Silicon Valley and Hollywood, um, you know, and, and create a, a, a new e-learning, complete e-learning company with o television channels all over the world. Um, and, you know, everybody loved that. And I had, up until that moment, just had basic success. And it wasn't that I was like, you know... I, I didn't think that I had the meat as touch, but I, I believed in a certain amount of serendipity, you know. And so the learning for me was not to just explain it that we were too early, because that was just a symptom of bad decisions. And why did we make those bad decisions? Because the board, the investors, the founders, Akami and my co-founder, Maria, and, you know, the key management, everybody was in that. We were dancing, you know, along the same tune. Hallelujah. And why did we do that? Because we were the same kind of people. Mm. We were all risk, you know, willing, happy, socially, you know, apt people who were applauding new mm. things. We came into the office with a new idea every Monday and people didn't say, what happened to the idea we had Friday, you mm. know? <laughs> Forget about that one. This is the new one, you know, and everybody, okay, you let's had, go for the big idea. So we should have had a Gnell speak, mm. but people were not interested in Gnell speak at that time. People were interested in global rollout plans. And mm. I, I just became totally engulfed in that. And I dropped my good sense. And, Too uh, little diversity. 
diversity, but not just you know ethnical or no, gender, no, but, but mindset but, you diversity. Know, you need you need different people to qualify and qua you know mm. really really qualify your decision making, and that was a hard learned experience. Mm. When I talked to you earlier, Ingrid, you said, well, one of those crucial points for me was when I got fired. Yeah. No, I had, um, I had, um, a, a, this, I mean, I completely second what you say. It's actually the tough times that have made you more aware of who you are and what you want. And I had, when I had my son, uh, he had colic for nine months, mm. not something you would wish your worst enemy. And then after that, when I, you know, I was really happy to go back to work, I got fired. Uh, and it was a very tough experience, extremely tough, and I experienced from actually having relatively got good sort of uh, confidence to be down in the basement in, you know, mm. less than a day. Mm. Uh, but it was, I would say in retrospect, this actually been very good for me. It sounds crazy, but it, it forced me to reconsider what's important for me, what do I want, uh, what are my values, uh, how can I get triggered back, how can, I, how can I manage this situation? And, it, you know, they keep on saying sometimes, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Mm. And for me, it's actually been, in retrospect, uh, actually quite helpful and good for me professionally because it made me very humble and it made me very reflecting on what is important for me and what do I want to do. Mm. Helen, do you have a, a crucial point? So, yeah, probably several, but now I'm getting a little bit confused here between success stories and, and not so great success stories. But, but I, I would almost say, I would take, um, uh, because the world is not black and white. And I no? think that's one of the mm -hmm. important things. And I'm just thinking of when I stepped in two completely different cultures, and one time it was very successful, the next time it was absolutely not successful. Mm -hmm. And the first time I joined um, Ericsson Mobile Phones in 1995, so we go way back. And I was completely, I was in the world of engineers almost only. And there may be some, some out here who wouldn't, and I came from marketing and I was like, and I asked my boss, why did you hire me? <laughs> and he said, you know what? I don't know. <laughs> I, and he said, uh, we're still friends by the way, but he said, I have this gut feel that I need somebody who's not an engineer. So here I was kind of swimming in this ocean with engineers and, and I said to myself, let me give it three months and see what happens. And I stayed for four years and I loved it. And it was probably, I've had so many fun jobs in my life, but it was probably, it must have been one of my best jobs when we were defining the, the, the mobile industry. And so that was a real, which made me a bit gutsy. So the next job I took, I took in a way different, I took it in the biotech industry. Mm. And that didn't last very long because <laughs> that, that, that was an, uh, a culture I couldn't get used to because it was, it was slow and it came from, from the healthcare, the company came from the healthcare, uh, back pharma background and all of it. So it didn't, didn't fit me. And so I've learned after that, my, my lesson from that has been, I am really, really focused on trying to understand is the culture they are about to create going to fit me? Because very often, Companies are on journeys, so and we just talked about what's changing. It's not what it is today. It's very often they often bring you in because what they want to create. Mm. So what they're about to create here is that is that where I can make a difference? Where is you that where I can add? Is that where I can actually? That mm. so that's my learning from from two. I think in the beginning of my career, two mm. very different. Very situations. interesting, actually. I think because I want also want you to to tell us a little about uh, being a leader. What what are the key factors? in being a leader, in creating that culture? What is the most important things for you who has led a lot of people? Well, I mean, yeah, surely. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. I, just, um, uh, I, th I think leadership or, or managing a company or an organization is a relay race. It's not a marathon, which means that I think, I have a, I have a belief in that organizations and companies behave sort of like as a life cycle, mm. as a human life mm. cycle. It starts like a baby. Ola said, entrepreneurs, w what did you say? Wake up every hour and I'm being screams. hungry and being yeah. scared. But you know, from the baby who needs in company terms, cash and love, um, you know, you go through a growth phase and then you be teenage, you know, wow, needs organization. And then you, you know, get some st stability. And if you're not careful, you know, you go into old age. But I think, you know, through this life cycle, there are different kinds of managers needed. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, entrepreneurs very often end up in sort of a trap because they are not able to grow with their companies. 
And so they need to be replaced. They don't need to leave the company, but they need to be replaced and you need to professionalize the process. Mm. And I think that I've been, uh, I've been trying to figure out where, you know, I've been the most... Where are you know, we now? Yeah, where mm. can I bring value? And I think in my last job as an entrepreneur, it was to get that old incumbent back up on the road. And I could, you know, that was a challenge. And so I think I was good at that. And I think my boss, Eva Hamilton, was the perfect choice for that particular you know, organizational yes. challenge. Doesn't mean that either me or her, for that matter, was going to be, you know, we were not going to be good in the long term. So I think you just have to see what are the challenges, mm. just as you said, what are the challenges in the next five to six years? Are you the leader for that particular mm. time? So if you're sitting here and you're about to start an organization, you should look both on the persons you want to hire and the organization Absolute, and the, the absolutely. situation. And I think yeah. recruiters don't do that. Mm. I think, you know, they need to understand, they need to, you need to qualify that your boss and the organization that you're going to step into, that, you know, that there's a match, not just that you are the perfect mm -hmm. candidate, but, you know, is the culture right for you and are the challenges uh, there? And, you know, I couldn't, uh, yeah, I, there's a lot to say about this, mm. but um, I know I sit here forever <laughs> talking to you. This but is we have uh, to yeah. round up uh, soon. But I still want you to to share your leadership lessons. Well, I what think that I mean one of the things that has always been important for me is that I've always, or that has actually helped me and and my the people that work for me has sort of afterwards always said to me that, they, that it, it works well and they're very appreciative of and that is I've always very transparent. Uh, I always uh, communicate a lot, and I'm very transparent on where we're going, why we're going there, uh, what do I expect, uh, what would I, how would I reason. So it creates comfort and trust. Mm -hmm. People are completely sure on when they do what I want to do and not want to do, and they always know where we're going and why we're going. Mm -hmm. uh, so that has always been very helpful for me, and that has always so far at least, created a, a great comfort and security among the people working for me, which has enabled them to, in their turn, create comfort and security to the next layer. Because I'm a big believer in delegation. I'm an expert on delegating. I'm very good at that. Mm -hmm. But it necessitates then that you can create that comfort and that transparency and that vision so people know where they're going themselves. Mm -hmm. My best example is actually once when I was um, we had a meeting, and when I came into the meeting, I was a bit late, everybody was giggling, and then they asked me a question, and I answered, and then the giggling continued, and then they had a betting session before I entered, because they had a situation, and they had betted on how I would answer, and they were so upset because nobody wanted to bet against, because they all knew how, what I would answer, <laughs> and I answered exactly what they thought. So. So they knew you, they knew yeah. their leader. Mm. And that creates comfort in the organization, mm -hmm. and creates the then the, the courage for other people to take steps because they are then secure in their surroundings and that helps them to do the extra mile and the extra challenge. Mm. Anything very quick to add, Hilla? Uh, I, always, I always end up driving change, so I always start with driving, driving the vision, driving where you're going and then be myopic on that because then people know what to do. And then my second thing is, Get the right team around you with differences in, 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 in gender, in nationalities, in experiences, because then they make you think. You mm. never want to be the smartest person in the room, then you're in the wrong room. Make sure you're surrounded by smart people who think differently, and you, you'll, they keep you on the toes. Thank you so much for coming and sharing all your experience with us. An applause, my friend. Thank you. <laughs>
elected in your old magazine, in Becca definitely, Zatara, definitely. Sweden's most powerful businesswoman. Mm. So without further ado, I'd like to invite, with a warm round of applause and awe in my voice, Mia Brunel Lifor. Thank you. Please have a seat. Thank you. Very welcome, and thank, thank you, you for Ola. coming here and, and, and sharing with us. Good. Um, Hi, everybody. Hi. Isn't it great? It is. It's <laughs> wonderful to see all this. We, uh, I'm gonna, uh, I want you to take us into the, sort of the, the rooms of power and things like yeah. that later on. But first, I'd like to start, who were you when you were, when you were young? Just when you were young. Getting started in your when career. <laughs> yes, when I started in my career. So you want the 60s or the 80s? <laughs> <laughs> no, but early, sort of what were your dreams when you got out of school? Well, and when I got out of school, well, actually, first I wanted to become an air hostess, I think, quite early. And I almost did travel as much as an air hostess for a period of time. Uh, so that was one of my dreams, but then I felt I wanted to be a journalist for a period, a psychologist, an architect. I had lots of different dreams. I think that, so I just, when I went to university, I just applied to a number of different schools and I got into business administration and that's what it is. And then you didn't, you didn't grow up in Stockholm, but you moved to Stockholm? Exactly. I grew up in Dalarna, but I moved to Stockholm a couple of days after I'd left school. And you ventured into the finance industry. How was that? Yeah, that wasn't really planned um, either. But I started working at a stockbroker firm when I studied. Well, you uh, wanted to be an air university. hostess, you became a stockbroker. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and <laughs> I never planned my career, as you can tell. Uh, and I started working, that this was the late 80s, and of mm -hmm. course, all shares were growing to heaven, and everything was uh, in, in pink. Uh, but then, of course, there was a huge contrast with the uh, deep financial crisis in mm -hmm. the early 90s. Uh, so I had to find another job, uh, and I started at TV 1000 in MTG. Or it was Shinevik at that time, MTG didn't exist. And I mean, in, in the 80s, there was no private television. It was very early days. Yes, uh, So exactly. what was TV 2000 back then? Well, we were 10 people, roughly, I would say, sitting in a corner at Shrepsbrun. Uh, we made huge losses. Uh, we bought content, and, and uh, I think we were questioned a lot during that time. I think a lot of the media companies that were founded in in, uh, in Kinevik at the time. Both media and telecom were questioned and criticized, and will these companies ever become something? Will they ever be profitable? And I could actually recognize a lot of those questions and doubts over the last few years when we've invested in, in e-commerce, for example, or digital. You had the same, who will ever buy shoes or clothes on the internet? You need to try it on. I only buy black men's shoes and things like that, but it worked out. And how was it back, back in those days, Kinnevik and, and the ones yes. that are a uh, little bit older might, might uh, recognize these. They were yeah. uh, sort of known for being tough, sort of manly, uh, very sort of yeah. fast moving and aggressive. Yes. What was it to be sort of a, a, a young woman in that environment? Uh, th uh, frankly, I never thought about it. I never really noticed any difference. Uh, and I never even got those questions until I became CEO of Kinnevik. That's when people started asking me. I never really thought about it. And, um, uh, maybe it was the media industry was relatively new, so maybe it was more equal. I don't know, but also I think that that it, it's it's not as grabbig <laughs> <laughs> as they said. It's quite direct and straightforward, so more like a football team culture and transparent. So I, uh, I thought it was more direct than anything. Do you else. like that type of culture? I do. I think it's better that people tell me what they want than that I have to guess it. <laughs> and and um, if you sort of look at your inner, you, you look inwards, what yes. drives your passion? What fuels your, your, your ambition? Uh, that's a good question. I think that, well, one thing I think is that I'm quite curious about things, both about people and about facts. So I want to sort of uh, make sure that I, I I always want to have more facts and know more and, and Google things all the time. Um, but also I think it's, it's um, also to some extent some pre-programmed thing that you want to do your best or you want to do the most out of it. You feel like you're never really reach um, the finish line on, on anything you do really because you only work on it as much as you have time. But if you could, you would have done a little bit more or a little bit better on everything. So I think that, but a lot of curiosity, I think. So, so, and has that also, has the curiosity also guided your sort of career moves or? Well, maybe, but I think the, the good thing is really that whatever you do, whatever you learn a little bit about or learn more about is interesting. But, but, but is it really that easy? You're like the, the slatan of what you do. And there's no. a lot of curious people that are not in the boardrooms where you are. Isn't there any other secret source that you can share with us? 
No, I think that I think we've heard a lot before in the, in the former panel actually that I think it's really about doing what you think feels good and what gives you energy right now. Uh, what what can really engage me at this moment and choosing the right manager that mm -hmm. is so important because otherwise it can suck a lot of energy if you don't have a a boss that you you can connect with uh, or if you don't have a job that you feel you like doing. I don't think it's a good good thing to actually choose to do something because it looks good on your CV for your next step because then you're already thinking about your next step and, and you might not get there because you might not do a good job where you are. So yeah. a great job with a so-so boss or a so-so job with a great boss, which would you take? A so-so job with a great boss, yeah. I think, today, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, tell me a little bit more about sort of the, the journey within Chinevik. It must have been insane from being sort of 20 people and thinking, does the TV industry have a future yeah. to opening up telecom companies in 80 countries? And I don't know what you've been, been achieving since, since those early days. But I think the fun part has been this entrepreneurial culture and, and that you have the, the re that you truly can do things wrong and you can test things. I mean, if you, want to, if you want to change something, if you want to solve a problem and create a business, you need to do something different than what has been done before. And you can only do something different if you're allowed to do something wrong, potentially. Not that you want to do something wrong, but we learn a lot more from our mistakes and that forms us as managers and as people much more than if we can't really be formed uh, from what we haven't dared to try. So but, to speak. but now one of the common themes here is dare to, tra tr to try, fail fast, and so forth. Yeah. But I are there any things you regret from your career? Probably a lot. <laughs> I don't know. Good question. I'm sure. I mean, you do things all. Who? W I don't think anybody here has never done any mistakes or never. I think mm. that's a good part of us. So if you would relive your life, you would probably do it the same way, or is there any sort of regrets or, no, I would really have, have, have gone a different path? Honestly, you always think that you want to be younger. I mean, particularly I'm turning 50 this year, that's a magic number. Uh, but no, you really don't want to go back when you think about it, not really. So that's okay, yeah. that's the wisdom of, of, yeah. of, of, of moving on in the yes. career. You don't want to go back and you don't want to change yeah. it. So I, I think I can relate to that. I would be yeah. so tired if I was 20 again having to do yes. all these things. Yes, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if you could relive a moment again, yeah. a professional moment, which moment a would that be? A professional moment. Oh, that's a really good question. I, don't, I, th I think there are so many moments. I don't think there's one particular moment, as I don't think when you have a strategy or when you change or transform or build a business, it's normally not one single decision. It's, it's normally a hundred decisions that takes a direction and move things forward and create something. So I can't say one. I mean, it's so many, so many decisions that leads to one change. Um, I, I heard you quoted somewhere saying something about... Uh, so I have given an example once, or... You have to give one, yeah. No, you you yeah, slowed okay. us, I didn't want to push that, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> one example. No, do I, I asked you if I had given an example. No, you have no, no, okay, no. This was actually uh, This was actually another, <laughs> yes. uh, another thing you said, yes. that you take time. You, yes. never don't, you don't want to make decisions with a gun right. to your head. Exactly, that's what, true. What do you mean by that? Uh, well, I mean that I mean in a fast-changing world, you need to take a lot of quick decisions, and, and I mean that's part of you want to take decisions and not analyze things too much uh, because you need to change them as you go along. But at the same time, when you don't feel comfortable or it's a very, very difficult decision to take, it can be very complex mm -hmm. for many reasons, you, you need to take your time to think about what you really want and how you explain this to the rest of the world and, and how you feel about it. And normally we're not into heart surgeries. Normally no one will die if you take a day or two or a week to really feel comfortable with the decision you take. I think that's mm. quite important, uh, actually. And how do you, uh, and if a decision doesn't work out, how do you sort of analyze it ev uh, afterwards? And how do you sort of talk yeah, to yourself? Yeah, you have to analyze it afterwards and see why did, what happened, wha what, did, what went wrong. Uh, and uh, because that's, that's part of, you can't just allow making mistakes, but not analyzing them. I think that's important. So take us into the boardrooms, these mystical boardrooms where there are far too many men and when secret decisions are being made. Is it like that? Or what is it to sit on the boards of large no, companies? No, it's not. It's like, a, it's like any business meeting or any meeting. I mean, you have a group of people that has a, uh, an agenda and a strategy and they need to, but, but as a board, you really need to make sure you have the strategy clear and that you have a vision for the company and make sure you're going in a direction. And you need to be a little bit more, you need to, quite a lot look at the rest of the world in 
in this um, aspect. I mean, when you're um, in the management team, you're very, very focused on what you have and how you take that forward. In the boardroom, you have to be, look a little bit wider, uh, I think. That's something I've experienced anyway. And what, and what do you, if you look at leaders, both if they, whether they're on the board of, or, yes. or management, what makes a leader a great leader? I think that's um, not any specific um, particular personality, but one thing I do think, I think it's important that a leader, that you are yourself. Mm. Because only if you're true uh, and honest, you can really connect and convince people. I mean, it's not very selling or convincing to not be yourself. I mean, people can see through mm. that at any and time. And said that very well as well. Yeah, exactly. That was exactly the point. Because I think you have to be the, I really do believe in the personal leadership and whether you're it doesn't really matter how you are, but that you're honest, because then you can build trust and you mm. can build engagement, and then people will work hard. Mm. And wh what do you like most about your sort of chosen path? About being a board member now? No, yeah, about the, the, how you work right now. What's the most interesting part of that? Well, I think it's, 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 again, back to the curiosity. If you think about all the people you've met, all the interesting people that you get to work with, uh, and uh, problems to solve, but also all the knowledge around. I mean, Shinevik had investments in more than 80 countries in different, uh, different kind of sectors that all moved very fast. So it's. But how, I always wonder, how can you have a view on that? So many countries, so many industries. Well, how you can you sit and make decisions and understand something of it? Well, you also have to surround yourself with a lot of people that mm. has a lot of knowledge. Mm. Like someone also said, you need to hire people that are smarter than yourself. <laughs> That's rule number one. Yeah. Uh, if, if, if somebody's 20 or 25 here, uh, which yes. advice would you give them if they want to pursue a career in, 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 in business? Yeah, I think it, actually the advice I said before, choose something that you think is, is quite fun and that you feel that I can really be engaged uh, in this role and also choose a manager. I think that's what I would do. And if you're further on in the career, you're like, you're really talented middle management, yeah. but you're not really up yeah. there. How do you go from sort of middle management to top management? Well, I would give the same advice because you can only do a good job if you like the circumstances. Another uh, twist and turn in this conversation. Yes. By a magic wand, boom, <laughs> you are now uh, deciding everything in Sweden. Okay. And with that, your first deci decision would be to make it more friendly to the business community and more entrepreneurial, yeah. Yeah. what would you do? Well, first, I think I would abolish the dictatorship. But <laughs> secondly, <laughs> I think I would, I would really focus on the school system uh, and on the schools. I think that's, that's where it all starts. Mm. And I think that we should be proud about that we have some sort of equality in the schools in Sweden. But I think it's really important that the schools have high quality and that from the very beginning that we focus on building skills that are needed because that changes in mm. the society as well. But that also business cooperates more with schools. And I think that schools is what I would focus on, period. If you uh, look at, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's <laughs> what I No, but I think that's, that's I have a daughter yeah. and, and I also yes. think that will the school be able to give yeah. her the tools she needs? That's, that's, I'm worried yes. about, I worry about that. Mm. Um, mm. And schools need a lot of leadership as well. I think. Well, we, we will um, end with something that I would like you to reflect on. Zoom out and look at the world. Yeah. What's most exciting right now? And if you zoom in back, what's most exciting yeah. for you? Uh, well, if I zoom out, I think what is, and take a long-term perspective, I think what is really, what I'm curious about right now is, is what will what will the world look like in a few decades? I mean, you look at the geopolitical instability, the demographic changes that we have in the world, and to some extent the unsustainability. I mean, how will this develop? What, what will it look like in, in a few decades' time? I think that's, and how will that impact our businesses and our lives? I think but at the same really time, you have technology changing everything, so yeah, there's exactly. a very positive... It's global. Yeah, it's very positive, but it's just what will it look like more mm. there? And on a personal level, zooming back in, what's most exciting? I'm right here on a Friday afternoon and it's soon weekend. When will the sun come back? <laughs> oh, <Yeah. okay. laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks <Wonderful. Thank> so <laughs> And uh, Yomi, Yomi has come here.
in spite of the fact that she is under the radar now because she's coming out with her memoirs and can't do anything public. And that's why we also cannot film or uh, do press. But she wanted to come here and share this story because if we know this and understand this, with the technology we have and the resources and the creativity, maybe we can be a part of not only telling the story, but actually doing something uh, that, 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 that creates larger mm. impact. So I just think, how important are our work in this business? She puts it in a totally new perspective for me. Digital worldwide storytelling, that can really be the difference between life and de death for a person, between freedom and captivity. It's amazing. Take that to your heart and feel very important each and every day you go to work. You are important and what we do are important. And another thing that hits me is that if she can do this, we all can do the change we want to do in our lives. We can be all the change we want to see in the world. And the fascinating thing is that Yomi just came back from speaking at the UN. She's a TV star in Korea speaking about these issues. And she chose to communicate in all these different channel channels that are there. Uh, and I'm just, I'm becoming challenged to do more when I hear her. I feel that, uh, as she said, did you know about this and didn't do anything? But, so what we're trying in, in a little way here is to get everybody together, and this is not the end of the event right now. On the contrary, it's, it's the start of an organization, and it's the start of a journey. And exactly. I would like to invite uh, the, the actual, the original creator of the idea uh, that choose to care about us being here today, and who will also tell us on, on where women in tech is going from here. So please welcome Richard Stiver back on stage. Yes. Wow. Yes, Richard. How would you like to tell your day up until now? What do you think? I've been crying, uh, being devastated, Fantastic and uh, I don't know how, how we're going to take it here. I mean, uh, someone once said that with knowledge comes responsibility, and now we all have the knowledge, mm. Mm. so we're, we're all responsible. What I will do as a commitment in front of this group is when Yomi's book comes out, and if she wants to come back and tell the story again, I'll make sure that she gets in every TV sofa I can call, and in all ways try to help her get the message <coughs> out. And I think that could be a joint task we take upon us here. Mm. Absolutely. This sounds good, I think. This sounds really good. But the afternoon isn't over yet. No. Nope. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about how to get the organization started, Women in Tech? Where yeah. do you go from here? Yeah, so it, so it started like a, an amateur initiative of some, some free spirit stalls uh, who started to have an event last year at International Women's Day. And then the idea was very much to inspire talents to choose uh, a career or uh, a path in media and technology. So what we wanted to do is basically connect all of you with the startups, uh, with the big companies, but also with the people who can help you get in and, and accelerate in, in this industry. Uh, and we've been doing that through meetups like this, by having a presence in social media, but also providing internships uh, or praus uh, or other kinds of opportunities for you to go out and, and test this industry. But this is maybe sort of coming to close uh, for this event, but it's sort of the beginning of the, of the journey. So we're now going to form a, a non-profit organization called Women in Tech, uh, where we hope all of you will become members. And the idea of this is basically to be a little bit more professional. And there are a couple of different tracks. We want to connect all of you for these kind of meetups. Uh, we want to help uh, to provide job and job opportunities for, for young and for, for middle managers. But also, uh, as we talked earlier, providing this network of you know, successful men and women in this industry who can help drive change and making uh, media and technology much more approachable for, for women. So uh, we're forming this now and uh, we will create uh, a board and then basically come out with a, uh, a plan. And hopefully you're connected on LinkedIn. I think we're like some 1800 people now and on Facebook and we'll be on, on all kinds of uh, social media platforms. And one of the important things that everybody spoke about was to create role model and really applaud yes. people that are doing good things. 
And yeah, that's so what you're also going to do. Yeah, so that's, that's what I was thinking because, you know, when, when I grew up, you had Bjorn Borg and he was very successful. That's and not a pair of underwear for you young people. It's actually a tennis <laughs> player. Yeah, he, he, and then, you know, everyone started playing tennis. And, uh, and then we had Carolina Clift and then, you know, everyone wanted to be, be an athlete. And now you've seen the, the startup girls, you've seen the successful uh, leaders. And um, the idea was basically to showcase and create heroes uh, both among students, among entrepreneurs, and among business leaders. So we thought a good way to do that was to create an award and invite all of you to basically nominate people you think have been you know, driving change and uh, helping uh, put a light on how exciting this industry is. Mm -hmm. So we're now forming uh, uh, three awards, uh, the Student Vision Award, the Entrepreneurial Award, and also the Leadership Award, <coughs> which we will announce the first one here. Uh, as, uh, as the start of this exciting journey. And we are soon to hear who brings yes, women. Yes, we are. Yes, That's what we're going to exactly. do now. That's but do you know what? I have another surprise. Before we let you take over the, the award ceremony, we have to announce that there will be a party after this conference. That's one good thing. And the very second good thing <laughs> yeah, is that at 7 o'clock tonight at this party, you can hear Tove Styrke perform. Ah! Don't miss that. You all have your drink tickets, and don't miss Tove Styrke at 7. All right. Yep. And Excellent. let's uh, go on to the prize ceremony. Yes. We check out, and you check in. Absolutely. Stage Thank you yours. so much. Thank you. Let's give them an applause. So you all heard about the Oscars and the Grammys, and it's all you know very long. We will keep it short and snappy because you had so much ideas, so much things to absorb. Uh, but we want to give some recognition. And the first award is the Student of Vision Award. So the Student of Vision Award, the idea here is that I think we all agree that it has to start in the schools. It has to start early. And I was so inspired by uh, uh, an organization called uh, women engineering, they have introduced a girl to engineering day. And basically what it is, you get these, I had these 15-year-old uh, girls coming to the company and checking out, you know, how we do uh, via play or online radio, etc. And I think if you can inspire someone young so they understand why they should study, why they should do math, why they should endure all that stuff, because they have a role model. So what we want to do with the Student Vision Award was to recognize uh, a female student who basically been driving some initiatives to promote uh, women in tech. So in order to hand out this first award, uh, I want to have uh, Tina from Google up on stage. Uh, can you come in? So give her an applaud. Thank you. <laughs> so, so I worked at Google for many, many years, and Google does so many things to inspire students when it comes to uh, technology in general. Uh, yeah. So it's uh, with great privilege to have you introduce this award. Thank you. Uh, and actually, I'm really honored to be here today to present this award. And I have the motivation from the jury here, so I will read it for you. As president of KTH Women in Tech Network, computer science student, and communication managers at Flick. Our winner is on a mission to inspire the next generation of females to pr pursue careers in tech. Her positive, humble, and diligent attitude makes her a true student of vision. Please join me in congratulating Malin Arvidsson. <laughs> Do we have a mic for this <laughs> lovely lady? Yes. Wow, um, I'm still sort of out of speech for, from the previous speaker, so um, there's no tears, but uh, well, I think vision, hmm. What is vision, really? Um, well, I have to put it. No, 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 I'll take it for you. Hold okay, on. Great. okay. 
say I have to do some like feeling the stage. I was actually a dancer before anything else. So uh, one, one good tip for standing on stage is sort of moving around, playing, like lifting things. Okay. Um, so vision for me, I guess, is uh, problem solving. Um, I don't like problems. Um, small problems, big problems. Um, and I've, I think I have invested all my life sort of eliminating every problem I could try to fix. So I, so I can get a lot, lot more space in my head and in my life for other things. Um, so by practicing sort of how to get to the bus on time, you have to think what to wear when you sort of move to the shower. And when you eat, you have to eat like a hamster. So you get everything and you sort of have time to, ah, uh, you have two seconds and then, okay. That's problem solving in one way. Um, one other way to problem solve is, um, well, two years ago, I, I lost half of my hair due to some illness. Um, and um, that was a problem. Yes. Um, and the solution was not care about my hair. Uh, so, <laughs> so, because my hair is like this chair, it's, it could be yellow, it could be blue, it could be well, gone or not. Yes. So, uh, I think my, the only way for me to sort of identify with this is to um, remember when I, when I find the big problems. I, I can't really say this after that speech that I found big problems because, oh, okay. Um, but uh, I found a big problem with uh, equality and diversity at KTH and um, that I'm trying to solve currently. Um, yes. Seems you're doing a good job. It, it seems <laughs> like it, yes. yes. Um, and uh, I hope you all get sort of more feeling on how to solve problems and, and think of it not as something negatively, negative necessarily. It's just evolution. It's the only consistent thing. And um, yes. I think I we should give it an applaud. <laughs> 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 So maybe if you just have a seat. Yeah. That would put any Oscar speech to shame. <laughs> All right, moving on. Uh, the second award is the Women in Tech Entrepreneurial Award. So what we want to do, we want to recognize a female entrepreneur, a startup or intrapreneur, who basically been building up something new, who've been driving change and you know, pushing through all those hinders and all those things that make it difficult. And uh, I think there is, there's a, one woman uh, who is very capable and very qualified to hand up this award. And you met her already, so it's Helena from Telia Soner. Can you please come up on stage? <laughs> Thank you. So get uh, prepared to be impressed because I'm so impressed by this text. As if a PhD in particle physics and detection of the Higgs boson were not enough, our winner is now set to revolutionize the contraception market with a health app startup, Natural Cycles. Her tenacity, resilience and drive are traits true to any successful entrepreneur. And the winner is Elina Berlund. Haven't I seen you on the stage before at Women in Tech? That's true. I was there last year trying to, you know, convince everyone about a natural contraception while being eight months pregnant. It was not so easy, but a lot of fun. <laughs> yes. Okay, please. So. <laughs> yeah, so thank you very much. I, I also feel like so incredibly humbled and moved by the previous uh, story that I'm almost lost in myself and thinking like, 
I'm so damn lucky that I managed to always follow my passion. I mean, my passion was always to do physics since I was five years old. I always wanted to understand where do the stars come from, what are black holes, uh, what's the origin of the universe. And I managed to pursue this dream until I felt like, well, okay, I, I understand this, okay, now I can do something else. And, and now I can pursue this dream. I mean, I'm incredibly lucky, and, and all of you too, you have you know, the same opportunity as me. Uh, and oh, I, I mainly want to say thank you for this story. I want to keep it with me for the rest of my life, actually. Thank you. Wonderful. Let's give it a applause. Thank you. There, there is a great clip uh, of her pitching her startup idea uh, from last year. And uh, if you go to the clip from, from last year, it basically says, and then it helps you get pregnant, and then she's standing there with her belly saying, as you can see, it works, <laughs> <laughs> which is great. So, uh, the final award uh, is the Women in Technology Leadership Award. And the idea here is to recognize a female leader who basically been uh, promoting and driving change in, in the world of media and, and technology. And to present this award, there is no one better, no one more qualified, no one more respected uh, than Mia from Sinovic. Please. Well, I think that this leader, the, the winner of this award, has certainly deserved it. With over 20 years' experience in sales and operations at Microsoft, our winner, brings a unique blend of technical and management strength to her organization. A recognized leader and relationship builder, very important, she possesses the expertise and passion that inspire many to follow her lead. And the winner is, please come up on stage, Eva Fors. <laughs> Wow, what a day. And uh, for some of you, you know, what for me it has been, wow, what a week, because actually this Tuesday, I announced that I will leave Microsoft. So the 20 years of leadership at Microsoft, uh, it has taught me a lot. But now it's time for my next chapter, hopefully with some of you around here. But thank you for this award. Thank you all people around here, because there are actually a few people in here that I have been, had the fortune to work with in my teams, being a leader for some of you and being led by some of you as well. Um, leadership is, is something rare and something delicate. And um, to be, have the ability, I've been a lead at Microsoft for 15 years, both in Sweden and internationally. And I learn every day. And I think that is one of the most important things as a leader, to be super curious and super learner. I, I've always had people that are far better than me uh, at the things we're doing as a team. Uh, I have moved to 14 different positions during my 20 years at Microsoft, and I think it's great because one of the good things being a leader, as many others have said today, is that being a leader, you should have people around you that are far better than yourself. And I have had the fortune to do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please. So let's give them an applaud. Let's stand up. So, I think it's time to get this party started. Ola and Ulrika, uh, what's, what's going to be next? The first what's going to be next is uh, something that really, really needs to be said that ha hasn't been said. So, Indeed. Sandra, 
Come up here with team Johanna, Johanna Flora, come up Kanet, here. Everybody Flora. who's been working very hard behind the, the scenes. The hardworking women behind this event. An applause. And yes. uh, I mean, from, from this side of the uh, event, it's been absolutely wonderful and fantastic. Mm -hmm. And looking at the fire in the eyes of all of you and the energy in the room, I think I safely speak for most of you as well. Now we're going to uh, open, uh, open the corks, yes. get some wine and listen to some fantastic music as well. Indeed, it still ain't over yet. Uh, now we have this party to look forward to. Seven o'clock, Tove Styrke is going to play. Don't Thank miss you. that. And yeah. the rest to say is only that uh, have a good time, build companies, get together and mingle and create business. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.